This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is an old friend of mine, Mike Ritland. You probably know him from the Mike Drop Podcast, from his first three books, Team Dog, Navy Seal Dogs, Trident Canine Warriors, from his interview on 60 Minutes, or from his latest book, Un F Asterix CK America. And this came out last November. It's a fantastic read. Great gift for anyone in high school, in college, uh, anybody who you may think disagrees with some of the things in here. It's very well thought out. And uh, I always enjoy talking to Mike. We first met each other back at uh, ISA school, intelligence specialist, a school pre buds. And then we went through seal qualification training together back in the day, which is the next level training you go to after buds, uh, seal training. So, uh, now without further ado, my friend, Mike Rilland. Good to see you. It's awesome. Yeah, there it is. So dude, when this arrived, my kids saw it like immediately <laughs> and they all started, they yeah, started cracking up my daughter in high school and our little one's 11. And they were like, oh, you know, especially our 11 year old, you know, they loved, <laughs> loved the title. Uh, yeah. but I immediately yeah. gave it to my daughter to yeah. read cause I looked at it, you know, and, uh, and I was oh, like, really? oh man, this is awesome. This would be um, incredible for a high school kid to read for sure. Because they get so yeah. many, oh, as okay. you know, so many other influences and distractions and inputs out there that they, yeah. that they can't avoid. Um, so something like this that breaks yeah. it down the way that you do, which is, uh, unique and direct and thoughtful, um, is, uh, it, I mean, so valuable to, to anybody really, but in my mind, I was I like, ah, daughter read, you know, uh, but, <laughs> yeah, <that's awesome. laughs> but man, let's go into, let's just kick this thing off and, uh, get into a little background. Um, uh, did you grow up in Texas? I forget. I didn't. I actually grew up in Iowa and, you know, was out on the West coast the whole time. And then I moved here uh, at the end of 2008, right when I got out. Okay. So you, uh, yeah. So you, you made it before the mass migration of the last couple of years, uh, heading into your, your, yeah, it's, cra- state. it's crazy how much, uh, yeah, it's crazy how many people have moved here since, since I have, you know, I mean, it's, uh, like Dallas is as bad as LA now, traffic wise. I mean, at, at any given time, it's just nuts. <clears throat> I mean, it makes yeah. me not want to live here. Honestly, it's, it's that bad, but. I remember I mean, it was bad before. I mean, it was bad, uh, oh, yeah. flying to Dallas and then go hunting. Like when I saw you last time in, uh, in 2018, when I was on the, on your podcast, um, I mean, it was bad then. I mean, it was bad then it was bad, you know, in 2010. Yeah. Uh, and I can only imagine how it is, yeah. how it is now. But uh, where were you when you when you first heard about seals? Like, what did you uh, were you always focused on going into the military, and then you found out about seals, or were you uh, just kind of wandering and then found seals? What what came first? Uh, I mean, so for me, the like I was really inspired by both my grandfathers. Uh, my dad's dad was in the army in World War II, and my mom's dad was in the Navy. And uh, you know, just kind of hearing some of the stories that they had growing up, I was always I would say maybe a little, a little above and beyond what most kids were like from a patriotism and just being into military history and American history, specifically the world war II time period. And and I've just always been really fascinated and kind of from a romanticized standpoint, enamored by that that time period and that generation. And so, um, you know, I had thoughts of wanting to to serve even like in kindergarten, uh, when they ask what you want to do, uh, you know, when you grow up type thing, I had uh, a naval aviator as a, as a kindergartner, you know, that's when Top Gun was real big. And, and uh, so, I, you know, I wanted to be a pilot. And then as I got a little older, I wanted to be a little more uh, ninja, ninja like or what have you. And, and uh, so my mom actually, uh, well, my, my best friend and I at the time decided we were going to join the army and be rangers. You know, we used to camp and hike and shoot and get into trouble together. And uh, her recommendation was, you know, you're, you're, grandpa was in the Navy. Why don't you join the Navy instead of being in the army? And, you know, thinking that I'd be on a ship and and not be, uh, you know, kind of in the weeds, so to speak. And, uh, of course I, I ended up doing the same, same thing that the Rangers do anyway, as far as she's concerned, you know? So, um, but you know, it obviously all worked out. It, it wasn't really until I'd say like my sophomore year, I read a, an article, uh, in popular mechanics that kind of outlined, 
buds and the SEAL teams and showed weapons they use, missions that, you know, type of missions they'd, they'd go on, their history. And it was a pretty kind of all encompassing 101 uh, article. Actually, uh, I have the uh, that issue still. <coughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so that kind of kicked it off in the movie Navy SEALs, the book Rogue Warrior, uh, you know, kind of all the standard our generation influences that. It played a, an integral role in, in uh, you know, the design behind wanting to go in. And, and then really my junior and senior year, I was pretty laser focused from a, from a workout and training standpoint and nutrition standpoint. And I mean, that was a hundred percent what I was focused on, <coughs> on doing and, and, uh, and joined, uh, I, I graduated high school at 17 and then joined, uh, you know, the delayed entry program. And I had to wait till I turned 18 late, <coughs> late in the summer. Uh, to ultimately uh, go to boot camp right after that, I went to uh, Intelligence Specialist Day School, um, which I, I think is where we As we first I. met. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I think were you I, just coming you, in as I was leaving? Is that how that how that was? Yeah, yeah. Because you uh, you were in two thirteen, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, and I was in and I was in two fourteen. So like, yeah, you you were getting ready to go to buds when I showed up <laughs> in A school. I was like, man, he's. You know, he's one of the guys you and uh, Herman and uh, you know a couple a couple other guys yeah. that, that ended up uh, going a little head. Yeah, yeah. Obi so. and Ryan Dick and yeah, we had a great uh, yeah. we had a great little crew there. Yeah, yep. So uh, yeah, went went to the same same place and uh, got got out there right after you did, and uh, you know, kind of the same same type of uh, history after that. But I obviously didn't didn't go get my uh, my commission the way some of us did. But. Yeah, did. Uh, was that popular mechanics magazine? Did that one have the uh, the DPV, the Desert Patrol vehicle, like the Dune buggy? Was that one in there? Yeah. Is that the article? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, for for me, growing up in you know BFE Iowa, like you know, seeing this, I you know, I, I grew up competitively swimming, so I was I was pretty strong and comfortable in the water. I, I had toyed with the notion of going to college. I had a couple of partial scholarships to some smaller schools in Iowa, and. uh, you know, so that was, you know, it lended itself more to, to what my background was anyway. But, you know, seeing all that kind of stuff uh, again in Iowa where there's really nothing going on, <laughs> you know, reading that article was, was very inspiring and, uh, and really motivated me to, to, to join. Yeah. I remember the DPV, the Desert Patrol vehicle. So for those listening, if you saw the Delta Force and saw those, uh, those uh, Desert Patrol vehicles they had in that, I mean, they were similar. They were similar yeah. to those things. And then after, uh, you know, they look cool driving around the beach and maybe a little bit at Nyland. And then I think right after September 11th, they actually deployed. They brought the people back because they were decommissioned, if I remember, from Team 3 right before September 11th or a couple of years before, I think, if memory serves. And then uh, well, they brought the guys back. Didn't they call them like the Space Cowboys? They brought the guys back that had worked on them in the 90s and then yeah. took them to Afghanistan and they didn't really lend yeah. themselves to that terrain after all. Well, yeah. So the the interesting thing is they they look cool. Right. And, and, uh, you know, when they were kind of at the height of their, their program, everybody thought they were pretty sexy, but, uh, actually, uh, one of the platoons with, um, <coughs> at team three, <coughs> when we took down the manifold and meter, or, uh, the go plats, mm -hmm. uh, at, at the, the height or, or the kickoff of the Iraq war, you know, two nights before all of seal team three was in on that operation. And, uh, <coughs> the platoon I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was in with. Uh, another platoon and a, and a uh, SDV platoon, we took down the go plats and then the rest of the, of team three took down the manifold metering station. And, and there was one platoon that had DPVs with them and, uh, they were useless. I mean, they got stuck and, and, uh, I mean, they were just more trouble than they were worth. They were really more of a liability than an asset. But so, so we did actually team three did use DPVs to, at the start of the Iraq war and shit canned them pretty, pretty early. Cause they just didn't work worth a damn, but. Yeah. Good, but, good for uh, recruiting purposes. Good for the, uh, Coronado 4th of July parade for all those years <laughs> in the nineties. Um, and good for the cover from the, in, in certain from popular mechanics magazine. Um, but, uh, in, so in buds, you didn't have too much trouble with the, the swimming then you were, <laughs> did you have trouble with anything or were you just well, uh, good to go on everything? So, uh, well, I ended up getting rolled for swimming, uh, ironically, but, um, it, my, I guess some context on it is that my first day in, in greens was your, your guys's last day of indoc. Okay. So I had two, two months basically of pre-training before indoc started, which I just, you know, unlucky or, or timed it terribly or whatever. Like 
I, I wish I had showed up right before Indoc started because that two months of, of at that time, I don't know if you remember a guy reworts that uh, would go out on the beach and, and beat the class and tell somebody quit every day, pretty much. Uh, it just, you know, it, it beat the hell out of me. And uh, so I started, you know, kind of behind the power curve and already, already a bit beaten up, uh, you know, shin splint wise. And, and then, so <clears throat> I made it all the way to, uh, to six days before going to San Clemente Island with, with 214. And then I got rolled because when we were out at uh, Laguna doing our land nav course, I pinched my sciatic nerve uh during the the test and uh <clears throat> and when i got back i i was injured to the point where i failed everything like i, I couldn't pass a run a swim and no course you know i could barely walk and so swims just happened to be the first thing that i failed three of and then uh and then i got rolled so <coughs> luckily during that that time uh the, the rollback program was not uh, what it was when I was there as an instructor, uh, thank my lucky stars. I, I basically did nothing for six weeks. Like I slept yeah. 18 hours a day and ate 7,000 calories and, and did almost no physical training whatsoever, which for me was, was a saving grace because I, I basically just healed up, came back and, uh, and then just crushed everything. Like I, I PR'd every, everything, I, every physical activity from that point on and graduated no problem physically. So um, it just, you know, was kind of a timing thing and, and, uh, everybody's body's different. It just, it hammered me to the point where I, I needed that time off, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, so that was it. Yeah. That PTRR going into, going into, I guess it was, like, did you still roll into PTR or whatever it was? Um, that worked for, for a lot of people get to rest for a second, heal those shin splints yeah. or whatever else, and then hop right back in. Um, yeah. But, yeah. uh, and then you go team three, right? Well, we, we meet in SQT really. I mean, we met earlier, but then we're yeah. actually going through training in SQT in the desert in Nylon doing those, or the 14 mile ruck run in the middle of the, like the heat of August, yeah. um, where everybody like went down. Yeah. That was, cool. that was, I think there's like five of us that passed that whole, that thing. And then everyone, everyone's getting their IVs. And yeah. I think they, uh, rethought yeah. doing that in the middle of the August heat in Nylon where it's like 120 <clears throat> degrees out and throw on like a 40 pound pack and yeah. say, you know, run 14 miles essentially. Um, but that, yeah. that was a put that out evolution. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, that whole, uh, that whole phase of training at that time of year is put out evolution. I mean, just doing IADs in, in broad daylight with all your stuff on is, uh, is crazy. But I mean, I look back at it now and I'm like, I, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how we survived doing that stuff. I think about some of the guys that, you know, are, or, or were, you know, my age then still doing it. And I think, dude, there is no way that I, I could still do that job physically right now. Like there's no way. Yeah, you I don't know. know. You, uh, yeah, you, you know, I think if you if you wanted know, to, you could go out there and do that. But uh, you got a lot going on. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it. I just don't want to. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> you got a lot going on. So I remember the the run. I remember doing IADs for the first time. I remember fast roping for the first time through the hellhole in one of those helos. Uh, yeah. So there's certain things I remember yeah, from I mean, being out there for that month. There. That was awesome. That was so much fun getting and then floating down the uh, the canals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like that was that was pretty cool. And then other than that. I remember cleaning that place. Do you remember cleaning that place? It was like brand new, the new facility, and they put so much money into it. And yeah. we had to like toothbrushes yeah. in the cracks of the floor, like scrubbing yeah. away. Like that was, that was insanity. Yeah. I oh, I know. And, and it was, it was nonstop, you know, it was like, okay, all you, uh, you new guys out here basically are, are going to be the, uh, the Molly maids of, uh, of Nyland. And yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was every day, you know, it's just like, man, are we out here to train? Are we out here to learn, learn how to be a, uh, health and welfare specialist? Like, Jesus. yeah, that was wild. Yeah. Like wax on wax off. Like, Oh my Lord. Um, but, uh, and then you yeah. go to team three, like you, uh, you're, so you're at team three and do you have yeah. one pre, uh, September 11th deployment. Is that how that worked? I did. Yeah. The, uh, you know, at, at that time, it was, you know, prior to Force 21, prior to 9-11, <coughs> uh, they were still doing uh, the amphibious readiness group, Alpha, uh, ARG Alphas. <coughs> and uh, so for for me, it, and it being my first platoon, it was a bit of a double-edged sword in that, um, you know, the, the workup itself was almost two years long. Uh, it was like 22 months, uh, you know, of... of workup and fleet X and, and all that. It was like 18 months, 19 months of, of a workup. And then like six, seven months of doing exercises on the Lincoln and on guided missile cruisers and, and doing just a ton of VBSS and all this crap. And so, 
you know, I, I was a, a, a spanker new guy in, in, in my first platoon for almost three years, you know, and, and uh, it was just like the nice part about it was it was a lot of good learning experience from some senior guys that, you know, had a lot of experience and, and were good mentors. But you know, it's like you've been at the team for two, two plus years. And, and some of the guys are still calling you spanker and trying to tape you up. And, you know, it's just like, dude, like I get that this is still technically my first platoon, but like I, there's guys I went through bud, buds with that are like rolling into their third, third gig, you know, like, can we, can we drop the spanker <laughs> uh, crap, you know? And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 ultimately it was, it was a good experience. And, you know, from a big Navy standpoint, getting to, uh, spend, you know, weeks on, on our aircraft carriers and, and, uh, amphibs and missile cruisers and, and a lot of different boats w- was really cool because, yeah. you know, it was like an, an extended tour, basically, you know, we were on there for anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks, didn't have to really do anything job wise on there, <coughs> um, but just got to experience big Navy life and, uh, and get kind of a well-rounded approach that way. So that, that part was good, but, uh, but it, it did take, you know, a, a huge chunk of my first, you know, almost six years at, at SEAL Team 3 was one one platoon, you know. So wow. um, did that, did uh, the USS Cole got bombed uh, while we were on our first deployment. So we we responded to that, which was pretty wild. And then spent uh, <coughs> the rest of that, <coughs> that deployment afterwards doing uh, basically uh, port port operations, making sure that, that that didn't happen again, you know, vetting the tugboats and uh, going through the warehouses and making sure that all the supplies and stuff that were going on these uh, USNS and, and regular Navy ships were uh, were cleared and, and weren't uh, weren't going to blow them up. So, uh, you know, for a for a pre nine eleven deployment, it was fairly action packed. You know, we got to do a boarding, uh, you know, during that time also, which was 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 nice to throw VBSS in because we'd done so much of it to actually do it real world. Um, you know, and then came home and got caught right in between the. Um, the Force 21 reorg. So we got back in February of 2001 and then weren't forming back up for our next platoon until the following January. So we had 11 months of pro dev and, uh, you know, going to hazmat and load planner and all these uh, lame ass fun schools. Right. Um, but then 9-11 happened. And so um, <coughs> I ended up deploying <laughs> to Jordan for an exercise for like two months, basically right after 9-11 <coughs> which was uh kind of a rough gig because it was it was kind of up in the air as to what we were really doing there you know we we put a lot more resource into uh into going <coughs> and uh sorry for the cough yeah i know i had, I had covid last week so oh no dang how you feeling i feel fine i mean the the because my lungs are are jacked up from getting valley fever uh, which which we can get into but yeah you know, I lost forty percent of my lung capacity, so they're just sensitive. You lost uh, it before, that, or because of COVID, you lost it? No, because of Valley Fever. Got uh, it. Like I, uh, I got bought, actually offered a medical retirement uh, back in in '04 when I was a, an SQT instructor. When I got it, I got it out of Nyland and uh, was in the hospital and, and on convalescent leave for nine months. And what? Got How down did to I miss 100. that? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So I'll backtrack real quick. Is yeah, you know, did that deployment, did did the Iraq deployment, uh, came home, uh, and then came, uh, went straight to SQT because it was like, you know, there were, there were now guys coming back that had had combat deployments, uh, and, and they wanted you know fresh guys coming to SQT to to teach that, and so I went there. Uh, I was a land warfare instructor, and, and when I was out at Nyland, <coughs> I got valley fever. Can you explain and, uh, that for people? Because the, the, the people that I knew that got Valley Fever, a lot of them got it at sniper school out in Kalinga. Remember when yeah. we did Kalinga sniper school out there? And I think yeah. instructors are people that whatever, spend a lot of time out there stalking yeah. and, and all the rest of it before they switch stalking to Nyland, which now I understand didn't really <laughs> help yeah. things since you got Valley Fever well, as well. But yeah, uh, I think a lot better. of guys got it at Kalinga. Is that right? It is, yep. Uh, so it's a, it's a fungal uh, spore that, <laughs> that lives in the ground. Um, anywhere that gets like less than five or six inches of rain a year is where, is where it can survive. And, uh, and so, uh, I was out at Nyland and just, you know, got the short end of the stick, I guess, and, and caught it out there. But, uh, I, you know, I, I was, uh, I was running a, uh, goose off range where we had like 65 rounds that we had to, to get rid of. 
And uh, so I was RSOing, you know, I, I wasn't actually shooting them, but I was RSOing like 40 of them being shot. So I'm standing right there. And, and so the next day, like my chest was abnormally tight. I mean, it always is after you shoot a few of them, but, um, but it was like a lot worse than it uh, had ever been before. Cause I was a Gustav gunner in my second platoon also. So I, I'd shot in it quite a bit, but um, <clears throat> it just got worse, worse and worse, you know, two, three days later, I could barely breathe. And, and uh, I knew something was really wrong. And so they sent me to, to Balboa and I, I spent like three days in the emergency room and they were running all sorts of different uh, EKGs and blast lung protocols and, you know, filling me full of blood thinners. And, and they took x-rays and they're like, holy shit, you have all these blood clots all over your lungs. Uh, you know, but it ended up not being that as they, they got my blood work back after a couple of days. And it was positive for coccidia mycosis, which is, a you know, fungal lung infection. And so those spots were, were spots of mold basically growing all over my lungs, not, not blood clots. And so I had no idea what it was other than I, I had remembered hearing about it. Uh, Cause there was one sniper class in particular, like basically everybody got it. And there was oh. four or five dudes who got medically retired and it, and it just messed them all up. And uh, so I, I vaguely knew about it, but then researched it. And, and like I said, I spent uh, like nine months on convalescent leave taken really heavy, heavy antifungals. And I got down to a, like 140 pounds and the, the captain of the disease, uh, infectious disease clinic at Balboa said, you know, Hey, uh, um, uh, we're going to offer, offer a medical retirement. If, if you want it, um, you know, we, we could easily out process you based on this. You, you've lost about 40% of your lung capacity and, and it's not coming back. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I was faced with a tough decision. I was like, you know, Hey, I've got my first child on the way. I don't have a college degree. I was planning on spending a couple of years at SQT and then, uh, had, had thought, you know, maybe screening to try to go to dev group was, uh, was in the cards. And, and so it was just kind of, kind of turned my, uh, my apple cart upside down a little bit. <laughs> so I, I said, you know, what, what are the other options? Um, and they said, well, you, you need to at a minimum spend the next few years, uh, in an environment <coughs> where, where there's very little lung irritants. And I was like, well, shit, everything we do is lung irritant. Like that there's only one spot that that's the case and, and that's the center. So, um, so the, the master chiefs, uh, you know, the SQT master chief and the buds master chief just cut a deal and sent me over there and, and swapped a guy for me at that SQT. And, and then I spent my last three and a half years there kind of getting back to as, as close to normal as, as I could. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a, a tough gig for sure. And, and, you know, now at this point, it's been, you know, Christ, almost 20 years uh, since that happened 18 years ago. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't really notice that other than that, like when I get sick, uh, that this happens, you know, it's a, <coughs> just my lungs are, are pretty, uh, pretty sensitive to cleaning products, to smoke, to e even like heavy perfumes and shit like that. They just get irritated, like even going into a bathroom that's been cleaned with bleach recently, like I'll, I'll cough like this for a few minutes afterwards type, type thing. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, as far as getting COVID, like it, it felt like I had the flu for about a day, and then uh, just a, a cough and, and kind of a, a feeling like having a, a light cold, you know, a few days after that. But uh, this it's been about ten days now. The cough is still here, but uh, you know, like I said, that's par for the course every time I get sick. So dang, dude, that is crazy. Uh, and what else is wild is how many rounds, Gustav <clears throat> rounds that you you shot at one time. I'm not even shooting yeah. them; just being there as an RSO next to one. Isn't there like some sort of a uh, Four, four in a four. 24 hour period. Yeah. So, and it's like, well, it's, it's a technicality. Well, you didn't shoot 60 of them, you know, but I stood, you stood right there 18 inches away, you know? So yeah. Which I mean, is what's the same the thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, four. Yeah, isn't there so one with, the uh, isn't there one with 50 cal rounds too? I think there was something about 50 cal rounds. If, if there to... is, I, I don't know. I never ran any of 50 range. Yeah. Posted to I might be wrong. I might be wrong about that. But there is with Gustav, yeah. with with uh, yeah. uh, with Law Rockets. Probably, I mean, <laughs> all those things probably have a a number yeah, attached I'm, to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, once the Gustav kind of came in the full swing, we we rarely shot the Laws. So, yeah. uh, you know, Gustav is, is such a superior round. In Christ, it's mm -hmm. you know quite a bit bigger, and there's just a lot more versatile right. uh, versatility in, in the round. I'm surprised you don't have a, like a Gustav uh, round in, in one of the Jack Carr books. I need to put that in there. I think I need to. Put, yeah. I forget sure. if I did or not. I put a couple other things in there, some more <laughs> historical type, uh, some Strela type stuff, some Russian type, yeah. type so former Soviet type, uh, type weaponry yeah. like that. But uh, uh, I think I need to bring in some, uh, uh, well, it's not even U.S., but um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Gustav should be the, exactly. Yeah. Should be the giveaway. Yeah. Um, yeah. man, that is wild. Uh, but taking it back, like when I see pictures of you from buds, like when you post them every now and again, yeah. I'm like, Oh, you look so young. Holy I mean, man. I mean, we I all was, look I young. Was 18. Yeah. I mean, you were I mean, young. I was, yeah. I was, a, I was the youngest kid in the class, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for, for a, a long time. And then, uh, you know, so yeah, it was, it was definitely weird. I mean, I would say that even as a, as a teenager and the first couple of years in the SEAL teams, like I, most people always thought I was older than I was. And, and I tended to, to befriend or, or hang out with guys that were usually a, a little older than me. I just, uh, not to say that I'm necessarily, uh, mature. Uh, I just, you know, for whatever reason, seem, seem to kind of gravitate towards, uh, people thinking I'm, I'm older than I am. And now it's, it's exceptionally that way. Most people think I'm 20 years older than I am, but, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, you know, going through there, I see pictures and, and, uh, you know, with no beard <laughs> and a full head of hair, uh, uh, you know, Christ, I looked like I was 12, I know. Uh, but you know, the reality is I was only six years older than 12. So, you know, it's not a huge stretch, but yeah, seriously, <laughs> it's crazy seeing how young, you know, you see pictures today, of guys going through and you're like, oh man, you know, they look just like, like kids, which yeah, essentially, like kids. you know, essentially they, are, they I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, oh, it's crazy. But, uh, so in that first deployment, when Nicole happens, had you hit a couple other ports beforehand? Like what point in the deployment does that happen? It's fairly early on, I would think a month or two into it. Yeah, it, it was about midway, um, midway, you know, so, so it was kind of a, an ideal deployment because, um, you know, we, we flew start, starting out. So we jumped on a C-130 and flew to Hawaii, uh, and then from Hawaii to, uh, Kwajalein and, and, uh, you know, the, the South, uh, South Pacific Island chains that played a huge role in World War II. That was really neat to just kind of island hop and, and refuel, yeah. what have you, and then ultimately ended up in Australia. And uh, and we were in Australia for like six weeks working with the North Force guys and, and up in the Northern Territory doing a bunch of exercises. We uh, uh, we tested out a, a fast cat uh, for for potential Navy use. That fast forward, uh, you know, we actually rode one back from the Go Plats in uh, in Iraq after. Uh, after we took it down, we, we hopped a ride on, on the same fast cat that we tested. What's a fast, fa- what's a fast, fast cat? cat? Uh, a catamaran. So oh, okay. Like, uh, okay. imagine a, a huge, like, you know, not like a little, a little mini yacht catamaran, like a, a Navy ship size mm-hmm. okay. catamaran. So it, it's, we, we were testing them out for, uh, kind of like the, the, those hurricane class, uh, little mini amphibs mm-hmm. that they, that they attached to seal teams for a very brief oh, wow. period and realized mm-hmm. it didn't work for the ship. Um, it's kind of that same thing is that they, you know, the, the thought was if we can deploy an entire platoon or task element on a fast catamaran and and they're deployed on that, then they're not on these other ships because the benefit was, is these fast cats did like 60 knots, you know, I mean, like they just hauled ass. And so like we, we rode one from Australia to, uh, you know, all the way up to like Papua New Guinea and back and like, and it was not like being on a boat. It felt more like being on a, on an airplane in terms of turbulence. Like it wasn't a swell. It was like a, you know, like this weird, you know, turbulence type feeling even in rough seas, but, but you could, you could move uh, some serious uh, territory on those things comparatively to to everything else, except an aircraft carrier, which obviously they're not going to dedicate to a SEAL team. So uh, it, it was a neat deal. We, we cross trained with, uh, with a bunch of force recon guys and we were on, on board with them for, for weeks and, uh, just did a lot of cool exercises and, and even did a, uh, non-combatant evacuation operation for, uh, for an embassy out of, uh, uh out of Indonesia. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, it was, it, you know, nothing, nothing happened, but, uh, still. <clears throat> but it was still, still cool, you know, and then, uh, we jumped on the, the bunker Hill, a guided missile cruiser in, uh, <coughs> in Australia when we wrapped that up and we were on our way to Bahrain, uh, get to Bahrain and then the coal gets hit. Uh, so then we jumped on, uh, the Tarawa, um, and then rode the Tarawa down to, uh, where the coal was. And then that's where we, we basically sat off the coast, the Tarawa, uh, the LPD six, the USS Duluth, which is what we were deployed on. And then the, uh, the Mount Rushmore, that was our, our main NFIB group that uh that was just basically sitting there and so from sundown to sun up every every day for 63 days we went and, and guarded the coal basically because the the al-qaeda cell in that uh, in in the port of aden uh kept trying to to test the water and, and their goal was to sink that ship initially and so they they, they were kind of cat and mousing it the entire time we were there and, and uh, so there was a couple of times where they tested the water and we had to respond and 
and what have you. But we had a, a sniper, a Gustav, and a 60 gunner on the bridge of the coal with a C2 element. And then we had two ribs with all the rest of us knuckle draggers, uh, you know, kitted up and, and just patrolling the area around that, you know, waiting for, for fishermen and other assholes trying to come in and, and mess with us. But uh, yeah, it was, it was two months of that. And then finally got it on, uh, on the Marlin Spike, uh, which was a, a floating dry dock. Uh, and, and it was while it was, <coughs> it was being loaded on there and secured is when uh, there was a, a ship from, or a boat really coming from, uh, it was a tugboat coming from Aiden. It was hauling ass straight towards it. So we responded and kind of the balloon went up on, on the ship and in that kind of almost movie like fashion, like everybody's getting all their stuff on quick and we jump on the ribs and go take this boat down and, and it ended up being nothing, but, uh, uh, but it was, you know, it was kind of a neat, uh, neat real world boarding opportunity. And then, <laughs> and then we went to Dubai after that and, uh, and spent about six weeks in Dubai doing all the port operations. And then after that, uh, it was right around Christmas time from Christmas until early February, when we got home, we went to, uh, we, we jumped back on the Duluth, got to go spend, uh, like a week in Thailand. Uh, and then, which was awesome because we pulled into Phuket. Uh, but then myself, one other guy in, in our AOIC took a six hour cab ride all the way around the Annaman Sea and went rock climbing at, uh, at PP Island for, for like three days. And, uh, while everybody else was getting, getting torn up in, in Phuket, <coughs> but we come back, uh, get back on the boat, go to Hong Kong, spend, uh, you know, a few days in Hong Kong and then, uh, go to Hawaii. And then we flew home from Hawaii while the ship ship rode from Hawaii back to, uh, to San Diego. We got to hang out in Hawaii a few extra days and then fly home. So for a first deployment, it was, it was pretty, pretty packed of a lot of, you know, a good mix of some cool real world stuff, especially, you know, pre nine 11, uh, as well as, you know, some pretty good Liberty ports and, and getting to really travel the world, get the, the full kind of Navy fleet deployment experience out of it too. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, usually it's kind of, you know, one or the other, you're either getting after it or you're on one of those deployments where you're hitting Thailand and those other places, but, uh, but have a mix like that for your first deployment. That's yeah. pretty good. Especially Australia. Yeah. Australia is legit. Oh, yeah. Like that was a good spot. <laughs> we went down there <laughs> yeah. and worked with the clearance dive team on that, uh, on that first deployment for, for me. And that was pretty cool. Cause they picked up and then they went to East Timor. So no one knew what, when they were coming back. And so we just sat there and waited for them in surfer's paradise, yeah. which was, uh, which is yeah. not a bad deal. Um, right off the bat, yeah. especially pre September 11th, but, uh, but yeah, that's wild. So you get to do, a, you hit Australia, you hit Thailand, you hit Hong Kong, you do a non-combatant evacuation, you do a shipboarding, you yeah. do security for the coal. Um, I mean, that's a, that's pretty serious yeah. right there. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, and then, so, uh, you know, the, the two month, uh, stint to, to Jordan, uh, you know, was, was actually pretty cool too, uh, right after nine 11, because it was, it, it was, you know, a, a very heightened level of, of, uh, <coughs> kind of security. Yeah. There were a couple of times where like we, we got all ready to go do something and then, and then ended up not doing it. But the, the feeling of like, I don't know why we're here, uh, you know, but we have stuff that we don't normally have for exercises and they've put a lot more, uh, weight into this one than they, than they have in the past. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a forward operating base type of, of environment that we were cross training with the Jordanian, um, special forces guys and the Jordanian seals. And, uh, so that, that two month, you know, kind of long exercise, mini deployment, if you want to call it, that was, uh, was just a, a good, you know, other kind of fit and, and mm -hmm. international experience that, uh, you know, it was neat to be a part of. And then the Iraq deployment, Similarly to the first one was kind of a nice mix too, because right before we deployed, uh, they had designated us, this was, you know, before Iraq kicked off, um, we weren't going to go to Afghanistan and they designated us a, a Southeast Asia platoon. So I went to Tagalog for six months. I went and learned Filipino. Uh, and then we ended up spending two months in the Philippines, uh, cross training with the Filipino seals, uh, because they were going down and fight, fighting the Abu Sayyaf and, and the Moro Islamic liberation front. And so, you know, we were, we were doing a lot of heavy training with them and then they were going down and, and mixing it up right away with, with these uh, ASG guys. Uh, and so that was a pretty cool experience. You know, uh, the Philippines is, is a neat place and uh, we got to go through, you know, the, the jungle survival training school and, uh, you know, just got to spend a fair bit of time there. And then we left there backstaged at Guam and then it was like, Hey, our axe heating up, probably going to go. So swap all your shit over from, 
from jungle, uh, you know, regular woodland camo stuff to, to desert stuff, side all of our stuff in desert wise, long range, paint all your shit. And, uh, and we're going to Kuwait. And then we went to Kuwait and dirt dove, uh, you know, the, the go plats for, for two months basically. And then did, you know, a, a legit real world go plat where we took 32 prisoners and, and, you know, the manifold metering station smoked a bunch of dudes and, uh, and then went up into, into Iraq and took down the palace and to Crete and, and did, you know, scud base operations in, in Baghdad and, uh, you know, got, got a, a lot of, you know, kind of mixed experience of, of, you know, assaults of QRFs of, you know, go plats of, of, uh, you know, scud base takedowns, I mean, all, all kinds of different stuff as opposed to like just one fob going out and, and doing hits, you know, every night it was, it was a good mix of a lot of different things. We did some route recons for the first Marine division where we were up you know, 25 miles ahead of them, uh, ahead of, of the lines at the time, uh, you know, kind of behind enemy lines, if you will, or, or behind the front mm-hmm. or in forward, you know, in, in front of the front. And so it was just, again, it was a really good mix of, of getting to do a lot of, a lot of things like that. And, and, uh, you know, the first part of the deployment was Southeast Asia and the Philippines. And then we got to do Iraq and do a lot of stuff there and then, and then come home. So I, I was really lucky to, to be able to jam that amount of stuff in in two deployments and a, and a FID, a fit deployment, if you want to call it that, um, you know, so, um, it, it was, a uh, it was just a good, good time to be in, I guess, but <clears throat> yeah, that's a solid run right there. Did you, uh, did you guys train up on go plats in that platoon or the one before did you do those? Uh, yeah, the, the one, up? the pre nine 11 one, I mean, we did so many go plats. Like, I mean, it was just the amount of EBSS we did, um, both, you know, uh, boat, boat wise and helo wise, HBBSS, regular, uh, shipboard SBBS was it was absurd i mean we mm-hmm. did uh there's over and over and over and over you know so uh and and the second platoon we were you know we stayed together so it was you know an influx of a handful of new guys but uh you know we already had a lot of experience and then uh just running running the the two months basically getting ready to do the the real world go plat i mean um you know from a cqb and then go plat or or the ebss standpoint i mean i, I would have put us up against fucking anybody honestly mm. i mean like we we were so dialed in to where i mean it was just like i didn't go to dev group but i mean it it, it reminded me of what you hear guys talk about of, of like the speed with which we were able to do stuff was yeah. was on such a next level compared to to what it was in, in the regular workup and stuff because we just we did it all day every day for two months straight you know with the same crew you know so uh it, it was a uh, it was a pretty <coughs> um pretty thorough thorough experience that way <coughs> so when you guys were in guam did you know that you were going to do go plats um before you left there or did you figure that out once you got no. to kuwait yeah it wasn't until i mean we'd been in kuwait for probably 10 days or so before it was kind of like okay hey the war is probably going to kick off and, and a night or two beforehand we're gonna we're gonna secure the oil platforms and the manifold metering station and, and to date it's still the, the single largest special operations mission mission in U.S. history because wow. it was all of all of SEAL Team Three. We took down, and in conjunction with the uh, Polish Grom platoon, nice. uh, we took down uh, the the Maybot, uh, which is Mina Al Bakr oil terminal, and then uh, Kor Al Amaya Kbot. Um, they took down Kbot. We took down Maybot, uh, as well as four other SEAL platoons from Team Three. Took down the manifold metering station. We had to do it at the exact same time. Uh, because there was uh, basically 30 miles of, of four 48 inch pipes of, of oil between the, the metering station and the oil platform that if, if they blew up, which they had planned on doing, uh, it, it would have been like, you know, a hundred Exxon Valdez, Valdez mm-hmm. spills, uh, you know, in, in the Gulf, uh, making us look like total assholes more than we already made ourselves <laughs> look like, uh, you know, so it was, <laughs> it was crucial that we did it at the same time. And, uh, and we managed to do it. The, the hairy part was, um, when we, <coughs> when we got on board, there were some Navy divers, <coughs> there were, uh, a bunch of Iraqi, uh, Republican guard guys. There were some, uh, Saddam Fedayeen guys, and there were some, uh, some Navy divers and there was a bunch of explosives on board and, and they had, had been ordered to rig the, the pipes and the, and the platform to, to blow it as soon as we got on board. Uh, but. <laughs> Luckily, we were, we were able to to get on there and take take it down before any of that happened. But uh, but it could have been could have been a pretty dicey dicey deal. 
Yeah, no, that's incredible. And when, when you got on there uh, on your approach, did it remind you of the, of the training you've done or were they totally different than the ones that we trained off of in California? Yeah, it, it was both. Uh, you know, there were elements of it that were vastly different than I was mm-hmm. like, man, training does not prepare you for this. Mm-hmm. Primarily in a lot of the movement that we were doing was very different than, than the super choreographed stuff that we had done in training. Like it was so much faster and so much more fluid and dynamic and just like, I hate to say sloppy, but, but kind of that, like, it was just fucking everybody going, you know, there, there was a method to the madness, but it was not that super structured, you know, cause it was like, we had no idea what, what was where, and, and there were, you know, live dudes all over and we were breaching, uh, myself and, and, uh, one other guy were, were the lead mechanical breachers. We, we, uh, breached over 60 metal doors, uh, throughout the birthing and in, in the space. And, uh, you know, so it was just, it was, it was very chaotic and dynamic, much more so than, than it typically is in training. But, um, the, the actual approach, yeah, it was, it was just like it, you know, it was the same, like, you know, we're all, we, we ended up instead of, uh, doing helos, uh, we wanted to be as, as stealthy as possible without diving because it just, you know, the, um, the timeline of trying to do it while the manifold metering station was not realistic if mm-hmm. we're diving and trying to do it at the same time. So, so we ended up basically uh, riding the rails of a couple of ribs <coughs> and uh, and just hauled ass up. You know, we were really quiet up on, on approach. And then the last, you know, maybe 70 yards, 100 yards or so, just hammered it and fucking came up and and flooded the place. And uh, and so, you know, it was it was a weird mix of some of it was exactly like training. And then some of it was was very, very different. And that target you know, the, the scope of that target, the, the length in its entirety was 1600 meters long. So it took us like six hours to take it down. You know, it was a a long, long, exhausting night, but, uh, but you know, we got, got everybody hogtied and then a a contingent of the, of Marine, like fast, Mm -hmm. fast team guys came on board and, uh, and, you know, we, we handed it to them basically, and then jumped on the fast cat, uh, went back to the Kuwaiti Naval, Naval base. And then we went from there up to Ali Asalim Air Force Base, <coughs> loaded up four Humvees, and then uh, two days later drove across the border up into and went all the way up into Nazaria when uh, General Mattis was was the CEO of the of, uh, First Marine Division, and uh, there was a supply route going through Nazaria that had been ambushed pretty hard and was taking some heavies, and he actually asked uh, Harwood, uh, our, our Commodore at the time, if we would come up and do some kind of counter ambush stuff. So we spent a few weeks there, uh, you know, kind of am- trying to ambush the ambushers and, <laughs> and, uh, did, did some assaults and some QRF stuff. And, uh, and that was, uh, it was a pretty neat deal is when the Jessica Lynch raid took place. Mm-hmm. Also, we were, we were right there when that happened, but jeez, man, so for the go plats, you guys are at M fours at this point. Cause I think that, or you are MP fives, MP fives. Yeah. Oh, no so kidding. Had, uh, Olive grab, uh, flight, flight suits, suits and MP5. Yeah. I didn't know when that Navy switched seals, over because yeah. that deployment, yeah. that one right after September happened when I was on deployment, we did those ship boardings and yep. MP5s, yeah. we were on it. Yeah. And, uh, so I was curious when you, uh, when you switched over, but, uh, yeah, still with the MP5s at the beginning of yeah. Iraq. Wow. Yeah. MP5s and sawed off shotguns for, uh, for breaching doors. So that's awesome. That's <laughs> legit. Yeah. Oh man. I need to add an MP5 to the collection. I have my eye on one actually right now, but, uh, a lot, a lot of, yeah, cool history there. Um, but yeah, going back a tiny bit further, like you hear about, you talk about it in the book, you talk about it in the book, you talk about where you are when nine 11 happens in your car, uh, driving, like you're driving into the team, I think. Um, and, uh, when you heard that, did you, uh, not just the emotions of it, but did you think you were going to miss the fight because you weren't already over there? Did you think that, Hey, this is going to be a long-term deal? No, I mean, to me, it was, it was the opposite. I figured like it's, it's go time. And I think, uh, at least the guys I was in the platoon with and, um, and that, that was just the sense that, that you got at least mm-hmm. at team three was everybody was like, Hey, pack your shit. It's, it's for real, you know? And, and it's not that we weren't training for real before. It was just like, this was obviously a very sobering and, and very renewed sense of, yeah. of, of what we're here for and, and why you joined, you know? And, and so to me, like I, I felt very kind of honored and privileged to be active duty in a platoon at a SEAL team when 9-11 happened because it's like there's no better place to be if you want to get your hands dirty for Uncle Sam, you know. So, um, you know, we were pretty fired up and, and uh, you know, that we, we basically, you know, I did that uh, two-month gig to, to Jordan and then mm-hmm. we, <laughs> we formed up right after that. 
And, uh, you know, so, so now it's like the first time, whether it's in buds or, or any of the years prior in the, in the teams, you know, working up and deploying or whatever, it's like, now you're going to, to say Fort Chaffee to do land warfare and you're getting real time feedback of like a, a operation anacondas taking place. So it's mm-hmm. like, th- there's no, no higher sense of like, you know, this training is, is for real and, and you better put everything into it. You know, when it's like, you're, you're hearing about our guys overseas, some, some guys getting killed and, and doing legit real world, you know, raids on mountaintops and getting shot out of helicopters. And it's like, Holy shit, like this is no joke, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so it was, it was a neat time, uh, focus wise that way, because it just like, it, it forced you to be hyper motivated and focused, you know, not to say that the guys weren't yeah. even five, 10 years later, but it was like it was that first kicking over the hornet's nest of like this is why why we signed up to do what we what we do you know yeah it was a special time i think to be in the teams like for, for us as operators but also for the families because we're all figuring it out together and it was all yeah. new yeah. you know a paradigm shift when you're talking about uh, how deployments work what our mission is going forward um what uh, paradigm shift for the terrorists as well you know the, what they'd done for the previous 20 years uh shifted a bit on uh, on september 11th as well so um yeah it was a, it was a special time to be in you definitely felt that energy i remember coming back from that deployment being on the team five compound and it just you're right it felt different you realized that hey the the 90s volleyball team five was uh was yeah. a thing of the past and it yeah. was time to yeah. go uh to go get some work get to work um but it was a really yeah. special time to be in i think for for everybody back then and, oh absolutely you know coming well, in today and i think yeah go ahead i think too like uh you know everybody i think you know thinks their class was the hardest or the time that they were in was the best but i i really do think like our generation of of getting that that best of both like young enough to experience pre 9 11 and, and kind of what the the 90s seal teams were like and then you know the, the transition into post you know 9 11 and post 9 11 and and what everything that came after that like getting to to do both of those things i think we we were just really lucky to be a part of, of both of those eras you know yeah um because it's like some of the guys that put us through like trade at and and, uh, you know, some of our, our training and first platoons that like have been seals for 10, 12 years. And, and then at that point, like, it's not, they were necessarily too old, but it's just where they were at. Like they kind of missed the party too. And, and yeah. it's just like, you know, we got that kind of old school, hard seal team forging at the early part of our career, but then got to, got to do real world shit that, that they kind of missed out on a lot of them too. And it's just, um, yeah, I just, I feel really, really fortunate to, to be the age that, that we are and, and from the era that, that we were in, you know? Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, having the, the keg on the grinder and then like running down to IB and then having drinks down there on Fridays or monster mash, mashes together and just having that, uh, that glimpse of the nineties, but not having to have spent most of your time there. Uh, and then going to war, um, and, and sensing that shift and having everybody be on the same page as far as mission focus. And there was just a different sense in the air and you were adapting. Like, I wonder if you came in now, now we have obviously 20 years um, to look back on and, and lessons. And now you're stepping into something that's established. It wasn't established back then in 2001. Like we were figuring it out for a good couple of years there. Um, oh, yeah. And it was, a, it was a really special time to, to be in, I think. So I, I think you're absolutely sure. right there. But on that uh, on that Iraq deployment, is that where you first had uh, your your first experience with uh, military working dogs and and realized that hey, that's something that you were gonna do going forward? Or how did uh, what was your first experience with uh, with the military working dog program? Yeah. So when we were up at the, towards the end of that deployment, we were up in Tikrit, uh, Saddam's hometown, took the palace down, and and there were you know the entire first Marine division was there, and and uh, there was a, a an explosive detector dog <coughs> in the same area <laughs> that we were at. <laughs> And, you know, we had been through the same scenario that these guys had this dog in, I don't know how many times, and we never had dogs with us. And, and it basically alerted on a, on a grenade booby trap, um, you know, and, and without question saved a couple of dudes, uh, you know, from getting blown up. And, and that was my light switch moment of like, why the hell do we not have dogs? And, and man, that's such a cool capability. And, and growing up in Iowa around a lot of duck hunting bird dog guys and, and seeing just dogs using their nose for something as, as kind of, uh, less serious or, or more hobby, like of just, you know, going and, and retrieving quail or ducks or, or what have you. Uh, I was always fascinated by that even, even back then. And so this was kind of like the renewed sense of, of like the big boy version of using dogs, using their noses for, for a job. And, and so for me, it was, 
it was a done deal. I mean, when I came back, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. And and from then on up until I sit here talking to you today, you know, I just, uh, I did everything I could to, to learn everything I could trained with whoever I could train with, you know, seminars, books, DVD series, you know, working with departments, sport clubs, you know, going to, to Europe to wash sport clubs and import dogs from there. I mean, you, you name it. And, and, uh, just, just got into it super heavy. And is that you're still in at the time you come back from that deployment, you do the SQT, you get your, you lose 40% of your lung capacity. You're, uh, you're going through, through all this. And, uh, and are you, and this is when they're starting the dog program, right? In the SEAL yeah. teams during that time. Yeah. So, you know, it was a, it was neat to be again, just kind of fortuitous of, of being at the center, which is, you know, across the street from where the dog program was being stood up. Uh, you know, and, and I knew some of those guys and then <coughs> and worked with them a little bit. They sent me to, uh, you know, to some schools on the West coast, uh, some canine schools to see if I, you know, wanted to uh, come over and be a handler. And I did, but you know, at, the, at that point it was, it was a very tough decision as I was, you know, transitioning out, I'd spent years, you know, working with dogs and training with them and, and doing a, a little bit of stuff with the West coast guys before I got out. But then, you know, they said, Hey, we'd love to have you come over and, and be a handler if you want to reenlist and I don't have you. And at, and at that time, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a feeling of like, uh, anxiety or, um, just, just kind of the fear of the unknown for me of, of not knowing if physically I, I really had uh, enough bottom end lung wise to be able to do the job and not be a liability, you yeah. know, and, and I, I didn't know the answer to that, you know, and, and to me, it was like, I, I'm not sure. I, I know I don't have, you know, the, the bottom end that I did, you know, a couple of years ago. And I don't know if, if I'm going to, you know, be a pain in everybody's ass or not. And, and because I don't know, I don't feel comfortable enough or confident enough to say, yeah, let me stay in and see how it goes. Cause it's, mm -hmm. you know, to me, that's just not the right way to do it. Like uh, I don't want to put, you know, our guys in, in a position where, you know, I'm, I'm holding people back or, or I'm a danger to, to our crew because I can't keep up or, or whatever. So, um, and, and there was also a, an element of, and this is something I've kind of always lived by is that is the cost benefit analysis standpoint or perspective on every big decision is that, you know, what, what's going to give me the most bang for my buck. And as much as I wanted to stay in and, and just be with one dog and be a handler and get to deploy and, and do that. I also know that, you know, from a big picture standpoint, I, I felt like I could make a bigger impact if I started my own company and provided dogs and trainers and training and ran courses and stuff like that. So it was really neat to be able to get out and then start my, my dog company and, uh, and then ultimately get the training contract for the same group that, that offered me the handler position and go back as a trainer uh, there, as well as running training courses at, at my facility where, you know, SEAL team canines are, are coming to my facility. And, you know, I've got my ATFI explosive permit. We're running explosive detection, detection courses and working on, you know, ambush bite work scenarios and stuff right down the street from my house, um, you know, and, and all around my property and stuff like that. And <laughs> being able, <laughs> excuse me, to uh, you know, to kind of get the best of both worlds. Like I'm still working with guys that some of whom I was instructors with or even went to war with, mm -hmm. um, you know, and now like handing them a leash and selecting dogs and, and, uh, getting them trained up and, and sending them overseas to, uh, to do the, to do the job. So it was, for me, it was just, you know, again, it was like kind of the pinnacle of, of everything that I was <coughs> passionate about and, and yeah. enjoyed and, and, and wanted to do. So it worked out really well. Yeah, no, the dog program, incredible, saved so many lives over the years. Um, and I, I believe that, you know, it went, Delta got it from Israel, I think, then damn net kind of, so they all, they started there, then we got it in the regular teams, but built up this incredible program. Guys learned how to select dogs in Europe, come back, train them, do all this amazing stuff. And I think my first dog experience was Afghanistan in 2003, but we didn't have a program yet, like an established program. And I remember, I think we just grabbed like a military MP of some sort. Yeah. And, uh, so we had a Belgian Malinois. I remember that thing was so mean. Um, I remember they took off the, uh, the collar for like a second and the dog was like, <laughs> like it looked, it changed, like it changed. It was like, I know this collar's off. So I'd make my escape. Uh, but that was like early on. I don't think people really knew what they were doing yeah. back then, especially, you know, a dog that yeah. was probably trained for, you know, maybe explosive detection or just to sit there at a gate, something like that. And now it's going yeah. on target with us. And, you know, it was that that was that was pretty pretty cool though but then the program became so professional and uh i mean yeah. absolutely incredible but your your company got big quick like you you're out you decide to start this company uh so you start tra 
Tricos. Is it Tricos or Tricos? Tricos. I've read it so many times over the years. I've never actually said it. Yeah. So try Tricos. Um, so how do you figure out like, hey, I'm going to start a business. What do I need to do? Do I do an S corp? Do I do an LLC? How do I grow this thing? Who am yeah. I? Am I the CEO, COO, CMO, CFO, all these things? Yeah. How do I, like, how did you build yeah. this, uh, this company out of the gate with, uh, with essentially no background in, in business. Cause I did the same thing you yeah. know, in writing. You have to, it's a business as well, but zero background. You just got to look at the battle space and adapt accordingly. But how did you, uh, how'd you build that? So the, the, there's actually two, two parts to that story, I guess, is, is that the first company I started, I, I partnered with two other dudes. One guy who was, you know, from a business acumen standpoint was pretty savvy. Another guy that had a ton of uh, higher level government contract mm. uh, connections. He, he was a ranger. Uh, and then, you know, I had the kind of the dog knowledge and contacts. And so, um, that was kind of my introduction into how things go. But the reality of it was, is that, you know, I, I stayed in my lane and the guy who was the business guy, um, you know, ended up kind of steamrolling the, the two of us and, and we disbanded that fairly quick. So, uh, after that, then that's when I started Tricos just a couple of years later. And, and then, um, you know, I, I knew a couple of things of what not to do. Uh, and that was about it. And so, you know, I, I didn't go to, I mean, I have my, my bachelor's, but it's in criminal justice, you know, it's nothing to do with business. So, uh, you know, I learned a lot of things the hard way, like, like a lot of us do, but the, the, the two saving graces that I had, uh, were number one is that, uh, I had a, um, a series of fortunate clients, I guess, where, you know, I would sell these high end personal protection dogs to high net worth folks. And, you know, over the years, like at this point, I've been doing it 12 years, but, um, but, you know, those first few dogs that I sold to people that, that, you know, were very business savvy and, and, you know, I, I could bounce ideas off of, and, and, you know, they would give me some advice on certain things and just over the years between messing things up, learning the hard way and, and doing something, realizing that's not the way to do it. And then to figure out the better way to do it in conjunction with, uh, you know, with, with doing that, uh, you know, certainly helped a, a ton. Uh, I had a good business mentor too, that, um, you know, hats off to, uh, our, our mutual friend, happy, uh, you know, he, he, and he introduced me to a, a guy, uh, that, that had done kind of a similar thing with him. Uh, and th those two guys helped me out a lot early on also, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, really kind of gave me some, some good right and left flanks to, to work off of. But, uh, from there, you know, my, my transition primarily over into, you know, books and online training and products and food and treats and all that stuff, you know, what was basically a culmination of years of realizing how big of a, a kick in the guts, um, service-based business is. And, and at first it was important for the experience, for the credentials, for, uh, you know, just kind of paying your dues and putting the time in, but very quickly I learned, you know, okay, well, I, I, I can only make money when I am, am working and not that that's a bad thing, but you know, I, the writing was on the walls. Like, I, I don't want to wake up at it's, you know, 63 years old and, and still be scrubbing dog shit off of kennel walls and, and slinging dogs out of the back of a truck, you know, to, to police departments and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I transferred over more into the kind of civilian sector of, of pet dogs, as far as products and training and things like that, just because the, from a market share standpoint, there's, there's 90 million pet dogs, there's, you know, 40,000 or so working dogs. So, you know, you don't have to be a, a mathematician to figure out there's, there's a lot more, uh, kind of potential on the pet dog side. And, and at that point, you know, I, I, for half a dozen years had been doing all the high level, sexy, uh, working dog stuff. And, and, you know, you can make a living at it, but it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, when you're, if you look at it from say the customer standpoint, you've got, you know, military groups, police departments, whatever you got me and, 40 other dudes, just like me, just like with tactics and shooting, like, why, why are you going to pick this guy over that guy and whatever? And so, you know, for me, it was, it was kind of a, an easy transition into focusing on, on the basic uh, principles of dog training and, and whether you're doing a, a high level bomb detection dog, you know, using a laser to guide them into to sweep a door seam or, you know, teaching the, the labradoodle to not knock grandma over uh, those, those principles with how you teach a dog to do something or not do something or shape that behavior is all the exact same, you know? So, um, it, it's, you know, taking what I've learned and <coughs> my experience there doing personal protection dogs, and then also just kind of more mainstream stuff and then providing ultimately products to, to transfer far more over into the, into the product-based business where, 
uh, you know, that's, that's where it's scalable and, and, you know, kind of big picture, you can have, have some sort of exit or retirement strategy and not, you know, just, uh, make ends meet your entire life the way, you know, unfortunately a lot of service-based stuff is. So, uh, that was kind of the, the progression with all of that, but, uh, you know, I'm still learning and, and there's a lot of things I look back of, you know, five years ago, seven, 10 years ago. And I'm just like, man, I can't believe how dumb I was, you know, some of the things that I did or didn't do or, you know, whatever, but uh, it's been a neat, neat, neat journey. No, it's been cool to follow along, you know, watch, uh, you know, watching from afar, seeing what you're, what you're doing, touching base with, with (laughs) happy every now and again and finding out what you're up to and, uh, you know, seeing the books come out and all the rest of it. Um, it'd be interesting to see what you think of the, of episode one of the terminal list, which is coming to Amazon prime at some point in 2022, we had a dog in there. So there's a, there's a dog in there and, uh, uh, I'll see what you think, um, when, uh, when you see that, uh, that scene, but, um, uh, also That's at some awesome. point you start the warrior dog foundation and, uh, what, what, when does that come in and what makes you think that, uh, Hey, there's a, there's a, some, there's a space here that needs to be filled and I can do it. Yeah. So it was, uh, you know, I'd love to tell you, it was this big philanthropy grand plan that I had, uh, nothing could be further from that. I mean, it was really born out of necessity and that, and this was all the way back in August of 2010, you know, at, at the height of what I'm doing, uh, you know, the, the dog program stuff and, and, uh, <coughs> you know, <coughs> Vaporwake or bomb dogs for for TSA and, and uh, DHS and Customs Border Patrol, you name it, is that uh, there was a unit that, that had a couple of dogs that had both been injured and uh, and you know they were looking to retire these dogs and uh, nobody nobody would take them from the unit. Is basically you know these dogs have bit a bunch of people they weren't supposed to. They've been injured. They're cranky. They're they're old. They're just these crotchety dogs that uh, they're kind of ass eaters. Uh, we don't really know what to do with them. And so they asked me and a, and a handful of other guys kind of, uh, you know, in, in a similar position, if we would take them and everybody said no, uh, you know, and then so a couple of months had gone by and, and then, you know, there were kind of questions again, like, hey, are you sure you can't take these dog, you know, kind of thing. And, and so I just thought to myself, well, you know, if you're asking again, that means everybody else has said no. It's like, what, what are you guys going to do if nobody, if none of us take these dogs? And they're like, well, unfortunately, we'll probably probably put them down because we just don't have the resources to, to maintain our, our operational capacity with, with the dogs that are currently here in handlers and take care of the old retired dogs. And so at, at that point, that was enough for me. I just said, fuck it, I'll take them, uh, send, send them here and I'll figure it out. And, and so that's what I did. And, and, uh, that kind of opened the floodgates for other units, you know, Rangers, you know, it's, it's a pretty small industry, you know, working dogs. And, and so, you know, and then police departments found out, you know, and so next thing you know, like I've got people, all over the country asking, you know, Hey, can we send you, we've got this dog who bit four people he wasn't supposed to, and, you know, we're going to put him down. Can you take him? And, uh, so for the first, uh, it's about 18 months, uh, almost two years, I, I just, you know, I took a bunch of these dogs in and, and didn't have the, the warrior dog, uh, foundation set up. I just took them in and, mm-hmm. and just kind of added it as a line item expense and, and just did it cause it was the right thing to do. But very quickly, I real, realized like, okay, this, this is going to bury me business wise. If I just keep taking dogs in that, uh, that, you know, are, are, are an expense and a, and a financial liability, uh, you know, without some sort of long-term plan, this isn't going to slow down. And so when 60 minutes came and, and, uh, did their, their piece on me, um, you know, that it was like, well, this is a pretty opportune time to, to start the foundation get it all, you know, kosher where it needs to be 501 C three wise and, and get, you know, an executive director and a small board and, and whatever, at least have it nuts and bolts wise where it needs to be. So that when the 60 minutes piece airs in conjunction with my first book coming out that, you know, there, there's some good exposure opportunity there. And so that's what we did. And, and then it just kind of took off from there. And, and, uh, you know, now, you know, here we are 10 years, 12 years later, <laughs> um, we've taken in almost 300 dogs uh, you know, that, <laughs> that, uh, every one of them would have been put to sleep if we hadn't taken them. And, and, uh, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's for sure a labor of love. It's tough to, mm-hmm. to take care of these dogs, you know, cause again, that, you know, the, the tough part is, is that, you know, these aren't the dogs that uh, are easy to deal with, you know, they, like you see like this movie coming out dog and there's max and, and, uh, you know, John wick three or, you know, whatever it's like, people see kind of the, the romanticized, mm-hmm. glorified, very singular or one dimensional aspect of these dogs. And like, fuck man, I'd love to have one of those, not knowing a lot of the other things that, that come along with it. And so, mm-hmm. 
the thing with every one of these dogs that, that we have in our, our care right now is that in every case, the dog bit a bunch of people that he wasn't supposed to. And the unit was, was going to put him to sleep if we didn't take him. you know? So if, if you can think about that as kind of, uh, you know, the pretext for everything, it's then, then it's like when people are like, Oh, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to volunteer to take one of these dogs. Hey, we, we appreciate that. And that's great. Um, 99.9% <laughs> no. of the people that, that volunteer to or Roger up to take the dogs just aren't, aren't a good fit for it. You know, we, we do still adopt some out and, and we've adopted a number of them out. We've even repurposed some of them where they're young enough to where we get them in, spend a few months kind of unwinding their mind and, and rehab them and then get them to a, another department that maybe has a little more experience with dogs like that, or, uh, you know, is, is better accommodated for, uh, for taking in, you know, dogs like that. And so that's been, been a nice, uh, uh, part of the, part of the project as well, but, um, it's just, you know, they're, they're hard dogs. They're cranky. They, uh, you know, every staff member I've had has been bit, <coughs> you know, generally more than once. Um, you know, and, and it's just part of the gig, you know, it's kind of like a firefighter getting burnt or, uh, you know, whatever, it's just, uh, like, it, it's not really a matter of if it's just when, you know, like you're, you're probably going to get bit at some point. I mean, I've been bit more times than I can even count. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, it's just part of the gig, you know, but yeah, I mean, I've been out there to your facility, of course. And, uh, I mean, it's amazing. So it's like a retirement community for these dogs that have, uh, uh, they've been, they've been trained up for a purpose and they're, they're retired out for whatever, whatever reason. And they're very hard to deal with because of how they were trained, but they, that's yeah. not their fault. You know, they were trained up that yeah. way for a purpose. And, uh, and now they come to you and on this amazing place in Texas and they get to run around the yard, but it's, oh, it's work. It's not just like, it's like, they're all sitting there oh, yeah. together. Like you, I, like two of these yeah. guys don't get along. They can't be out together. This one has to be out. No one can be around this one when it's running around uh, yeah. the yard, getting its exercise. And it's, uh, yeah. but it's beautiful. I mean, for them, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it's a cool place for them to be and to, to run around and get some like fresh air and be dogs. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like the villages for Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> you know, but, uh, it is. but you know, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it does make it tough, uh, you know, because it's, you really kind of have to run it almost the way prison systems are where it's like, okay, move this one into here and this one mm -hmm. and close this door. And then, you know, it's, it's like a, a Jenga puzzle almost or Tetris of moving dogs in from one spot to the next. And, and you really have to think about it. You know, if you get complacent, that's when, uh, when problems arise and, and people get bit and, and accidents happen is, is yeah. you know, you, you just kind of get complacent and, and it's mundane and routine and, and maybe you stop, you don't think about something and make a mistake. And, you know, they're, they're so quick to, to point out your mistakes that, uh, you know, you don't, don't usually get a, a, a lot of time to, to rectify it if you, if you do make a bad call, but yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's worth it. I mean, to, I will say that, you know, every time you, you go up there and, and you walk around and you see, you know, we've got 30 kennel runs and the, and the kennel is always full at this point. Um, you know, to see 30 sets of eyes staring at you that even though they're kind of staring through you, um, you know, knowing that, that in, in every instance, every one of these dogs would be dead if we hadn't taken them, uh, you know, is a, is a pretty special thing to be a part of. And, and one that I, I feel really blessed uh, that we've been able to, to have the support not even just nationwide, but even internationally, we've had, uh, you know, people, it's, it's a really neat kind of canine handler community internationally. Like, you know, there's handlers like in South America that, you know, donate 20 bucks or whatever, or buy a t-shirt or, or what have mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and it's really neat to see kind of the outpouring of support that people have for, uh, for these dogs. And, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is that, um, you know, all of our funding, fortunate, unfortunate, uh, is, is from the private sector. It's all, you know, uh, small donations from, from private individuals, or, you know, there's certainly some charity trusts and then some bigger ones from, uh, corporations and things like that, but there's no federal funding. There's no grants. There's no, mm. um, you know, government support, uh, when it comes to our organization. And, and there's a handful of, of other ones that are very similar. Um, you know, none of us get any, any help from uncle Sam, you know, which I think is a travesty, but, um, I'm not surprised. I mean, as, as uh, ill run as the VA is, I, you know, you shouldn't expect that <laughs> if we can't get that right, they're not going to have anything for, for working dogs either. But, uh, yeah. but, you know, luckily we've had, uh, had a lot of, of uh, very generous support from, 
from the private sector for well over a decade now, and, and they they keep us uh, keep us going. So, and it is a full time job when you go out there and walk around and see everything yeah. and see the facility. Like it's a full time job. It's not just something that you can like run out between yeah. podcasts or whatever else or between your other things going on. Like there has to be people there managing these dogs, and it is yeah. a full time gig. And it's it's WarriorDogFoundation yeah, com. Is that where people can go to? dot uh, org. Dot org. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Got yep. it. And uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's three full time staff. You know all the time there, you know, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's 24 seven really. I mean, because so many of them can't be out together. So, it, you know, you, you have to, most of them get them out one at a time. And, and so it's just, you know, you, you can't, uh, can't really slow down. You gotta, you gotta keep, keep getting after it nonstop, yeah. you know, and it's like Christmas morning, tough, yeah. you know, uh, it's your birth- birthday. It doesn't matter. That's right. Like you're, you're not feeling, feeling well. I mean, you know, it's, it's, that there are no days off. There's no holidays. There's no breaks. There's no, uh, you know, I'm tired this weekend. There's none of that, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but you got, you got to have 24 seven coverage with multiple people, 365 out there. And that, that's not, not an easy thing to do, but yeah, no, it's an awesome place. And my, uh, so my daughter and son, we went out there and, uh, so I have great pictures of them out there. And, uh, one of my favorite pictures of, of them is actually out there on your, on your place. It's a, uh, it's awesome. awesome. But, uh, so how did the books come about? How did the, how did the first one, was that your idea? Did someone approach you and say, you know what you should do is do this. How did the, the book come about? And then how did 60 minutes come about? How did that, all that, how did that puzzle come together? So the first, uh, the first two books, which are the same book, <coughs> um, Trident Canine Warriors and Navy Seal Dogs. Trident Canine is the kind of um, mature version or adult version. Um, Navy Seal Dogs is the young adult uh, adaptation of it. But uh, kind of backwards, the, you know, than than the way most book deals work, where um, St. Martin's Press, an, an editor there that had worked with some other military guys. <coughs> actually approached me about doing it. Um, I, I was, I was just fresh off of the contract on the West coast as, as a trainer and, and was coming back. Um, <coughs> coincidentally, <coughs> it was also right around the time of the bin Laden raid, which, uh, you know, when the general public, uh, kind of learned of, of a, of a dog on that raid, mm-hmm. there was a huge explosion of, of kind of an interest being yeah. peaked as it relates to, to working dogs and, and special operations. So it just, the timing was kind of there and, and the editor approached me and said, Hey, we'd love to do kind of a, a one-on-one book on these special operations dogs. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought about it. Um, I didn't say yes right away. <laughs> I, uh, you know, kind of molded over and, and then decided after, after thinking about it for a while that, that I would do it just because the, I mean, at that time it was, it was well before a lot of books had been written, but there'd still been a few written and, and, you know, it's kind of mixed, mixed reception community wise. And so it, you know, it, it was kind of a tough decision to make, <laughs> but um, ultimately, obviously I, I did it. And when, when the book was getting ready to come out, uh, 60 minutes, uh, learned about it, um, you know, and, and basically said, Hey, we'd love to do a, a piece on you and, and these dogs. And, uh, and it will coincide with the book coming out. So of course it's like, well, that is a no brainer. Uh, you know, it's 20 million people watch, watch each episode on average at that time. And so, um, so they came out and spent like a week, uh, at my house kennel facility and Laura Logan, uh, you know, did, <coughs> did all the interviews. I thought they did a fantastic job. They went and they interviewed a couple other handlers and, um, you know, did a, a very well-rounded kind of thorough piece on, on working dogs, uh, you know, as they are integrated into special operations and, and uh, the piece went really well. Um, and, uh, the book, you know, hit the New York times list and, and, uh, that just kind of catapulted me into a, a bit of a limelight working dog wise, uh, in, from my perspective, very unwarranted, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of guys out there that are far, uh, far more experienced or, or, uh, you know, every bit as good or better of a trainer than I am. I just, uh, was kind of at the right place at the right time, I think. And, and, um, you know, was, was able to take advantage of a few opportunities and, and here, here I am from it. But, um, because of the success of those two books, the, and the second one, Navy SEAL Dogs is actually a scholastic book program, which, uh, was actually really neat because I remember, you know, the scholastic book fairs growing up yeah. a little, uh, little pamphlets or little, uh, you know, handouts that they give with the books, uh, made of that like weird newspaper material. Yep, I totally remember that. Um, you know, uh, you know, so that was still a thing, at least here in Texas. And so, uh, Scholastic approached, uh, the, the publisher and editor and said, Hey, you know, this, 
uh, Trident Canon Warriors, we'd love to do a scholastic version, young, young adult version. Would you be interested? And of course we're like, well, hell yeah, we would. And, uh, so, you know, my, my kids at that time were, were elementary school age. And so, you know, to, to see them get to go to school and, and, and see the scholastic book program with a book that their dad wrote, uh, in, in the little mailer handout thing uh, that, that their kids were like, Hey, you guys have the same last name. I'm like, yeah, it's my dad. I'm like, no, it isn't, you know, but, uh, so it was, it was really neat, you know, to sign books and, and be a part of, of some of those, uh, like book fair things at night, you know, when they were at that kind of prime age where it was, where it was cool, it was a really, really neat experience. But, um, and then, so the success of those two, uh, spawned a, a, another, uh, publisher approached me about doing a more of a, a training style mm. book. Um, and so I did that with Penguin, uh, that, that also, uh, did well and, and hit the times list as well. And, and, uh, you know, had, had good success, um, you know, and, and was well received and then, um, kind of fast forward, um, you know, I started the online training, uh, around that same time and, and that's been going, going on for about five years now, but, um, when, once I started the podcast, that's when kind of the political uh, aspect of of what I do, I guess, um, was added to to my repertoire. You know, totally undog related. You know, nothing to do with canines or training or or what have you, other than you know maybe interviewing a handler or what have you. But um, I just you know had uh, an interest in in the the podcast and, and started it, and it. it gained some decent traction and, and did well. And, and so then again, that the same, uh, one of the same publishers approached me about doing basically a, a book, um, kind of based on, on the, the persona or right. kind of how I conduct these interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but they, they wanted to say, okay, like we, we love your personality on podcasts. It's like, well, it's not my podcast personality. That's my personality, <laughs> right. but like I don't put some weird hat on uh, and, and have some acting gig on there, but, but they, they wanted that kind of flavor or, or, uh, personality, if you will, and, and write a book about all of these hotbed topics. And, you know, for me, it was like, well, if you guys are approaching me about it, it's obviously cleared enough of your research ranks to, to warrant being worth doing, but a book like that, uh, as you well know, um, is going to be crucified in a major publishing house's editor's room. Like they're, they're you're going to cut my book in half if, if I say what I want to say and 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 basically verbalize and synopsize a lot of the discussions that I've had with subject matter experts of a lot of these you know kind of social hotbed topics. And so I was like, you know, this is a book I should probably do myself. You know, I've already done three, and I've got a you know enough of a literary following, I think, to where. It, it makes sense to just push it myself uh, for two reasons. One is that you guys are going to going to butcher it, and two, you know, uh, the the cuts that authors get for major publishing houses is, is not not spectacular. So, uh, so I did it myself, and um, and you know, just kind of plugged it plugged it all myself. But the <clears throat> kind of the the main goal with it was, you know, that the media mainstream wise has a very uh, kind of calculated agenda and series of topics that it, it as a collective wants you to, to worry about, know about, think about, be inundated with. And if you contrast that with the data of, of the actual things that our society is, is burdened by, plagued with, uh, and, and actually are, are the most significant in, in terms of our downfall, they don't match up. Uh, you know, and so I wanted to to kind of say, okay, based on the data, here are the the top, you know, eight or ten things that that our country faces statistically. Um, you know, and, and then say, okay, how did did we get to this point? Why are are things a problem in these key kind of social areas? And then ultimately, how do we fix it both as a as a nation, as a collective whole, as well as what you can do individually? And I wanted it to be. Um, you know, something that would inspire hope in people as opposed to make them feel overwhelmed, like, yeah, there's all these problems in this doom and gloom, but there's nothing I can do about it, which is how I think a lot of people honestly feel. They feel like their vote doesn't count. They feel like no matter what they do, it's nothing is going to change. And so this takes a, <coughs> a very <coughs> kind of really leadership or, or almost SEAL team leadership oriented uh, component to it by saying lead by example. You know, I mean, that, that's the, the short of it is that all of these problems, like, yeah, here's some collective policies that I think would go a long way to, to solve some of these problems that are, you know, not political, 
that are very no no BS, but uh, but very straightforward, and and I think could be very effective in combating some of these issues. But then ultimately, you know, uh, you you've got to be able to set the example that you want everybody else to live by and, and adhere to. Uh, if if you want the the country to change, and if everybody lived their lives the way that you want everybody else to live, uh, you know that that's a good starting point for for our country to to you know raise the the mean average of uh, of quality of of individual and quality of life in this country, uh, you know, from the ground up. Yeah, no, you do a, a fantastic job with this book, and you were kind enough to send me an early copy, that, which I sincerely appreciate. Um, and you start kind of general, and then you get very specific uh, near the end. I want to ask you about some of that, but uh, I want to go back yep. to the podcast real quick. So you started the pop mic drop, and it's, uh, I mean, you do an amazing job with it. And what surprised me most oh, about you. it is, uh, I mean, you have essentially right of this uh, this essentially a monologue for every, every guest, uh, at the beginning. And it's, uh, oftentimes funny, very insightful, very well written. I mean, it's really, really cool. I don't really know anyone else that, uh, that does something like that, uh, in the space. Um, and, yeah. uh, and it's you, you know, it, it's all you and you're doing it and it's, and it's so cool. And I love that you, uh, that you do that, but, um, how did you even figure out how to do a podcast? Like I started recording when I got a little, the thing here that records, I got some headsets I recorded. That was my limitation. Like I, it's, you know, it's yeah. good to know your capabilities and limitations, uh, yeah. I, yeah. accounts and platforms and how to upload and all the rest of it. Like, oh my goodness. Um, so how did you like yeah. figure that out and, uh, and then build this podcast, which is absolutely fantastic. You ask incredible questions. You do a ton of research into all of your guests, even if you know them like me, when I sat down with you, I mean, you're still writing out all these, all these questions, still do that very insightful monologue at the beginning to intro. Um, and it's just, just fantastic. So how did you, how did you come up with all that and figure it out? Well, I, I appreciate all the kind words. I mean, it, it, similarly to the business stuff as I just kind of started it. Uh, I didn't start it for no reason. I mean, I like, like the online training, like some of the books, like a lot of things that I've done, it, it stemmed from people asking for it, you know, is that I, with the book interviews and, and just being kind of in the, in the industry that I'm in, I had been on a number of podcasts and, and uh, in many cases, a lot of the comments were, you know, like, Hey, your episode was my favorite of, of this guy's show or whatever. Have you ever thought about having your own? Like, you know, I love the, the way that you talked about certain things or articulated this point or, or whatever, you, you should have your own show. And, and I just, I heard that enough over a couple of year period where I was like, maybe I ought to just, you know, try it and see, see how it goes. And, uh, and so that's, that's really what I did. And, and in terms of my strategy for it, similarly, it was like, okay, I, I've been on a lot of podcasts. Some of them were really well done. Some of them were very poorly done. Um, I know what I liked as a guest mm. and i know what what made me feel like they gave a shit and and weren't wasting my time and and also how they were received you know some were received very well and, and were entertaining and some weren't and i just kind of looked at, the, at those patterns basically of like okay i like this from this show and this from that show and you know i didn't like this i want to make sure i avoid that and and just kind of had a general game plan that way of of kind of constructing it and, and then just started doing it. And uh, I, I will say, I mean, it hasn't changed a ton in terms of the format mm -hmm. and kind of how I go about it because it just seemed to work for me fairly well right out of the gate. And so, um, I mean, I do pick up certain things and get more comfortable with, with others and what have you, but, uh, but that's really kind of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it is, is, is I, uh, I know what I like and I, and I know what I think is entertaining and what seems mm -hmm. to do well traction wise and, and, you know, numbers wise and growth in YouTube channels or, or, uh, you know, on, on the audio side on iTunes or whatever. And so that's, that's been kind of the key thing. The, the one thing I will say that I, I differ from most, um, <coughs> other shows is that I, I only do them in person. Yeah. Um, obviously it's way more convenient to do it and how we're doing it now. Um, but I just, you know, no different than like, uh, you know, any other interaction mm -hmm. that you have with, with people, it's, it's just, you know, like text is the most or, or the least intimate. And then, you know, phone is, is next. And then zoom is after that, and, you know, nothing beats in person. Yeah. You know, if I was, if it was a lighter subject matter or, uh, you know, it was, you know, just off the cuff kind of shooting the breeze, uh, I'd probably do more zoom stuff. And I may, you know, I've missed out on some pretty big name guests, uh, that were willing to do zoom that, that, 
I wanted to do it in person and they just either wouldn't come or, or the schedule, yeah. you know, or, or it was going to cost way more than it was worth it to get them there, uh, expense wise, just, just covering their travel expenses or whatever, mm -hmm. that it just didn't make sense to do it. Um, but I, you know, in 2022, I'm, I'm kind of reorganizing, uh, or, uh, you know, kind of hitting the reset button a little on the mm -hmm. podcast and, and over the next couple months, I'm going to ramp it up and, and try to put a little more time and effort into it, uh, including maybe bringing some bigger name guests on that because of the nature of who they are and, and their schedules and what have you, I may have to do some, some zoom stuff. Yeah. So, uh, I would rather not, but it's just kind of reality of it, but, yeah. uh, but that's really it. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, um, you know, I, there, there wasn't like this, you know, huge structural thing that I planned out. It was just like, well, let me do a couple episodes based on all the things that I just said of what I think makes sense for it to go well. Mm -hmm. and, and I did, and it seemed well received and, and I just kind of kept doing it. But yeah. And I mean, you have great guests. It was professional right out of the gate. Everything from the intro, you know, the mu music, the name, like all of it was just uh, super professional right out of the gate. Um, and uh, the Laura Logan interview was just so powerful. I mean, my goodness, yeah. what a powerful interview. But, uh, I mean, if, I, if I had known that uh, it was going to have the, the traction and impact that it did, I, I would have probably at least put a fucking collared shirt on. <laughs> you know, I, like, I, I, th I think I had this shirt on. And, like, <laughs> I just had uh, elbow surgery. So I had like this compression sleeve on, you know, keeping my stitches in and uh, you know, like, uh, I, I was a mess. I had to go down and, uh, you know, drive, you know, not long after surgery, five hours to go to her house mm -hmm. and do it. I was exhausted and, you know, it was just, but, uh, but yeah, that, that interview, I mean, she, uh, she's such a, a, a consummate professional and, and such a good interviewee, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, as a world-class interviewer. And, and I've, I've learned a lot from her too. I mean, you know, she's interviewed me a couple of times and, and I, I was fortunate enough to get to interview her back and, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just an amazing woman and, and, uh, made, made my job super easy that day and, and made me look way better than I am. But, yeah. uh, but that, that was all her. I mean, she's been through so much and, and has just one hell of a story and is great at telling it. So, yeah, it's incredible. That was so powerful. Anybody hasn't listened to that should definitely go, go check it out. Um, and, uh, but you, you prepare as much for that interview with her as you do for, for anybody, for me or for oh, anybody else. Yeah. I mean, you can, and you can tell you put that work and that is so obvious, yeah. uh, out of the gate, which is something I, you know respect about you, um, along with everything else, but I don't want to ask you too much about the specifics in the back. Cause I want people to go get this, um, get the book yeah. right here. And, uh, but I do want to ask a couple things. So America, yeah. the rich spoiled brat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, when you get to this stage and you become so uh, affluent as a culture and then start thinking that yeah. maybe you're not, and then you add, I mean, it's just, there's so much going on right now. I feel uh, that's why I think this is so important, especially for for high school kids to be to be reading, college kids to be reading, people just out of college trying to figure out that next move in life. But uh, can you expand on America, the rich, spoiled brat? Yeah, so I think we're we are a product of our own success, or a, a, a product of our own success in terms of of uh, you know that byproduct being a problem is is that, or I guess I should say we are a victim of our own success. Um, you know, starting with that World War II generation where, where that kind of set the stage, obviously the, the prior generations did also from the Revolutionary War all the way up until World War II. But that, that chunk of time is why we're at where we're at now, not because of the people that are doing anything right now, you know, and, and uh, that can only last for so long. But, you know, that adage of, uh, you know, strong times create uh, weak men, weak men create hard times, hard times create uh, you know, strong men, you know, that, that whole thing, uh, you know, is, is very apt and, and is taking place right now. And right now we're at, you know, good times creating weak men, um, you know, and, and the unfortunate part of that is it's cyclical and it's almost impossible to avoid because just like our kids, you know, your, yours and mine and, and everybody, you know, basically, if you look at, uh, you know, their, their upbringing as compared to the, the kids, their same age that we saw, uh, you know, overseas in the middle East and, and what, those kids have had to go through, uh, and, and what they, they deal with versus ours. Like it's, it's, it's a joke. Like it's not even comparable, you know, now granted, I wouldn't want my kids to lose their innocence and in childhood in a manner with which they would have to, to, to appreciate mm -hmm. the things that those kids overseas appreciate. But, but it is absolutely to a detriment uh, of our society is that, you know, now you've got this, this entitled sense, uh, you know, where kids are, are more depressed than they've ever been. They're more miserable than they've ever been. They're more entitled than they've ever been. And, and they expect 
you know, the world hand them uh, everything by and large, uh, you know, and that creates a, a society that, that isn't willing to fight for freedom, that isn't willing to, uh, you know, to do the things that are necessary to, to perpetuate the successes that we've had, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, quite the contrary, actually. And so, uh, you know, and unfortunately, as a society, we, we are rich, and spoiled, and, uh, and, and those chickens are going to come home to roost uh, sooner than later, unfortunately. And, and uh, you know, if we don't realize that and don't put some mitigation protocols in place to combat it, um, you know, the, it's going to be the Roman empire 2.0. And, and I mean, you already see it, you know, we're, we're essentially, uh, kind of crumbling from the inside with infighting and, and political, uh, you know, uh, infighting that, that takes place. That's just, uh, you know, it, it's absurd and it's embarrassing. Um, you know, and, and if we don't do something, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be irreversible here sooner than later. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I think you're right. Um, of course that world war II generation there, there, there were children of the depression. Um, children of the depression yeah. into a world war, everyone was affected by it. Uh, whether you fought or not, you had a touch point with someone or something, whether it's blackout curtains on the coasts, whether it's taking the tires off your car to support the war effort. Cause there's a little rubber there that can be used. Um, no matter what it was, uh, you were impacted by world war two and everybody, um, uh, everybody we were, I mean, we were a team and there were significant consequences yeah, was to, uh, we were all invested. Yeah. And there were significant consequences to losing yeah. that war. And yeah. then what those guys do well, when they got home, they built us into the country we are today. You're exactly right. They got yeah. to work. They didn't whine. They yeah. didn't, uh, they, they, I mean, of course there's issues, but they got to work well, and yeah, they, they built us into they, the They didn't have a sign up in, in their yard about, uh, being respectful of fireworks. Like they went, they went to work, kicked ass and, and built this country, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and they did such a good job that here we are, you know, a couple generations later, still benefiting from it. Yep. Um, and not only that, know, but, now uh, we're it, also, uh, voting people into office and, uh, actually, uh, supporting different issues, campaigns that take away the freedoms that those people gave us that take yeah. away the options and opportunities yeah. that those people sacrificed yeah for so that we could be here today yeah. doing what we're doing. Um, I mean, it's, it's so tough. I took my daughter out to the uh, 80th anniversary Pearl Harbor commemoration events in early December. Yeah, I saw that. And yeah, uh, awesome. it was an, a life-changing experience for her, I think. I mean, she'd, she yeah. saw the pictures of uh, her great-grandfather, my grandfather killed in World War II. She's seen the the, the model plane. She's seen his uh, awards, like that sort of thing. The silk maps they gave aviators back then. But now she got to sit down and talk to these guys, age 96 oh. through 104. And we volunteered for a full yeah week and she's helping him on and off the bus and she's uh she's taking him in the wheelchairs to these different events a full week of events mm-hmm. uh saw her great grandfather's name on the dead. mia wall uh because they never found his uh his body when he was killed off okinawa in 1945 um but uh but that was life-changing to have a touch point with these people and hear their stories so young i mean one yeah. of the guys got shot at was one of the first people to get shot at on the runway as japanese came over in pearl harbor and then ju- ju- jumped into this essentially a sewage ditch uh got up ran to the side of the uh, the, uh, uh, the water right there and saw them bank and come in and start dropping torpedoes in Pearl Harbor. I mean, wow. incredible. And then he went, went and he That's sunk crazy. a Japanese submarine and then he went and he sunk in the, yeah. went to the Mediterranean and he sunk a German submarine. I mean, amazing, oh, incredible awesome. stories. Yeah. And he never talked about yeah. it until just a few years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, Man, it's wild. I mean, and that's the thing is there's hundreds of thousands of dudes with similarly incredible captivating stories that you know are largely untold and uh you know it was one of my favorite things growing up in, in high school was talking to my grandpa he was on a minesweeper uh in the mediterranean and, and the there was a fleet of 98 minesweepers and two of them came home and he was on one of them you know it was just like and he was a cook you know straight out of steven seagal navy there we go. the uh like under siege see. right he was just a cook though he uh he didn't do anything other than that but but still it just you know the stories he had from uh, clearing mines and you know things getting blown up and and uh, just crazy stuff you know and it wasn't like you know e- even us going overseas where it's like you go for six months or three months or nine months or you know whatever there it's like you go and, and you come home when the job is yep. finished you know and it's like you know years and your snail mail that's the only way you can communicate and it just I mean like the the brass balls that that generation had it's just something that uh, you know. I, it's embarrassing. I think now looking at, at the things that we complain about and, and some of the things that, uh, you know, that, that we do, uh, as, as a nation that, uh, you know, that probably has a, a lot of those guys rolling in their fucking graves. But. I know. 
It's, I think about that generation every, every single day. Um, and in chapter three, you write when everything is an outrage, nothing is. Yeah. Well, so it's, it's, it's essentially the same philosophy as when uh, everybody's a winner, nobody is right. If it's the, you know, whether it's that's racist, right? Like, well, if you, I mean, it's the boy who cried wolf. Like if you say everything's racist, well, then nothing is at some point, you know, if, if something is sexist or homophobic or fill in the blank, um, you know, the, the more you, you have this feigned faux outrage, the, the, the more, uh, or, or the less teeth that, uh, uh, complaint has, you know, and, and we, we've done that so much over the last 20 years where everything is politically incorrect or it's insensitive or it's homophobic or it's racist or it's sexist or it's whatever that, you know, it's like white noise at this point, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, you, you, you have to realize that, uh, you know, if you're going to make a big deal out of something like it, it has to be warranted. And when it's not, then, uh, all bets are off and it just makes people not even care, you know, but yeah. And then you add social media to this mix. And of course, you know, at the beginning, yeah, maybe they wanted to sell advertising and then, uh, then they saw that power and how much that data is worth and how now we can control thoughts and behaviors th through it's yeah. just incredible. You write this and this, this plays into that though. And it's something I talk about as much as I possibly can about putting the time, energy, and effort into educating yourself on something before you retweet something from someone else who didn't but the time, energy, yeah. and effort into doing that research. Yeah. And you say right here, you say, don't take it upon yourself to regurgitate everything you hear. Don't hit the share or forward button within 30 seconds of skimming an article or watching a video. Doing so only further uh, only furthers a biased agenda and creates more of a divide. Some things need to be said and some information needs to be shared, but a whole shitload of it doesn't be discerning. Yeah. Uh, but I think that plays in to putting in the work. That's what you owe these generations that came before us is to study that history, put open that yeah. book and then think things through and think about, Oh, this, uh, th this freedom, this right that we want to curtail today. Well, look at how many people sacrificed everything so that we could be here even talking about it, even debating it. And then just taking, taking a breath for a second. And, uh, so I think that's so, that's so valuable, but you talk about that and you talk about the polarization in the media, which all plays in, together and it's an important things to talk about. No, for sure. It is. I mean, the, you know, that making sure that your info is valid, unfortunately, you know, our own mainstream media isn't even doing that anymore in a lot of cases, you know, like there's, uh, articles that, uh, you know, that certain groups put out or, or whatever that are just patently false. Uh, you know, and if they even correct it, it's like, you know, at the end of a broadcast, mm -hmm. the, the very last little fine print asterisk at the, at the end that nobody's watching anyway, uh, you know, is zero to, to almost zero accountability for most, uh, you know, false uh, narratives or, or incorrect <laughs> stories that <laughs> get shared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if, if our own kind of what's supposed to be trusted news sources are, are doing that, then of course your average uh, Joe and, and Sally that are on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, you know, are, are quick to share some, whether it's a Russian media bot or, you know, some Antifa, uh, scumbag that, that wants something or, or even on the right. I mean, there's, they're certainly guilty of it too, but, uh, you know, just posting these things that, that are, are designed to piss people off and get them up in arms about things. And they're just not even true in, in many cases, you know? So, um, that in conjunction with kind of my preface to every single issue, which is, ditch emotion, religion, and politics right, right out of the gate mm -hmm. is that don't let those three things bias or influence your decision. Uh, and the last thing that uh, I think is, is one where admittedly, like even I struggle with it, but it's one of the most crucial, crucially important things for everybody to enter into a discussion about is, is entering into it with the prospect that you might be wrong, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's hard for a lot of people to do, especially when you know, the, the, the platforms that our social media give you just enough time to think before you respond differently than you would in a conversation with somebody. And so nobody is really actually interacting to understand the other person. They're, they're interacting with the intent on responding and being right. Yeah. You know, if you think about for anybody that's listening uh, right now, you, you know, when was the last time that somebody changed your mind <laughs> on social media? Never like, or, or it's an anomaly, you know, like it's, it's absolutely an outlier, a fraction of a percentage, 99.99 times out of a hundred, you know, you, you have your idea and nobody is changing your mind and, and you sit there and, and waste hours 
arguing with complete strangers about shit that you're never going to influence how they think and they're not going to influence how you think. And it's just such a, uh, a toxic, vile, poisonous um, method with which we communicate that, that just does way more harm than good. Oh, yeah. One thing that I didn't put in the book that, that I, it, it was a kind of a policy that I thought of afterwards that I think would fix a lot of problems is, and, and not that I'm a government uh, influence guy or, or like I, I'm not one to want the government to get involved in things, but to me, um, with social media being as toxic and dangerous as it is, especially to young kids, uh, I really do think that uh, piggybacking on a driver's license is, is that uh, you, you get issued, uh, and, and you can use the same so that it doesn't, you know, cause a, a ton of work on on the government's part. Is that when you get your driver's license at 16, it, it's uh, piggybacked with a social media profile. And and you could even use an NFT, right? Is your your picture is a is a government verified photo off of your driver's license with your driver's license number. And when you go to sign up on Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, is that you have to submit that to them and they say, Yes, this is who you are, just like mm-hmm. you do with a business account on, on all those same things. And now you you don't get to get on there until you're 16. You have two years with your parents to help you navigate the same way you do it with a with a car, because at this point statistically social media is more dangerous than cars for for kids uh, and and by a lot uh, it cuts down on on people bullying like if, if you say i want to watch you you know have your kids skinned alive there's no hiding for that or, or it'd be very very difficult or there's still going to be people that manage fake profiles and whatever yes just like there's fake ids but it, it like the, the masses aren't going to be able to do a lot of the things that they could do. And if you want to run your mouth on social media, everybody knows who's, who's saying what they're saying. There's not, you know, these 3000 troll accounts and you can just have 30, uh, you know, Facebook profiles with stock file images and some fake name and go and harass people like that. That's going to be curtailed significantly. Um, you know, to me, like it, it, we're at a point where with the amount of hundreds of thousands of kids that are groomed online and ultimately sex trafficked because of that, that stat right there in and of itself is more dangerous than COVID. Every health disease, uh, you know, drownings, car accidents, uh, assault weapon murders combined, you know, more kids are, are groomed and, and sex trafficked than all of those things combined. And, and we are doing absolutely zero as a society to combat that by comparison. And that's one of my points is that that statistic should be the ticker on the side of, of CNN and Fox every night, not here's, you know, this many COVID cases and deaths. This is how many, you know, 16 and, and below kids were, were stolen and or trafficked, uh, you know, from their house because it's hundreds of thousands, you know. And so uh, to me, be, because social media and the internet is such a uh, hotbed and, and dangerous spot <coughs> for young kids uh, on top of, you know, the, the dopamine issues that, uh, that, that addiction problems stem from, uh, you know, from likes and retweets yeah. and all the other shit that the kids get get involved with like like it's dangerous uh it, it's and it's not up for debate like it's not a theory like that there's data uh coming out uh people's assholes uh you know in, in terms of, of proving how dangerous social media smartphones and, and things like that are for young kids and i think to me that that's a simple mechanism that wouldn't be that difficult yes it would lean heavily on uh, on social media but fuck those guys you know they're they're multi-billion dollar corporations anyway. And, and they, they, I think they owe it to our society to, to police themselves a little better. Uh, so that, that I wish I had thought of that before I finished the book, but it was something that came after. So, yeah. You can do an, uh, a next sure. printing. You can add it. You can add it in the next printing. But uh, I was going to ask you about that, about um, human trafficking, because you've had um, at least one guest, maybe multiple guests on Mike Job podcast where you're, you're talking about these things in depth. And was it something you were um, aware? I mean, we're obviously aware of it, but were you um, aware of it the way you are now before those guests and just had them on uh, for further education and educate other people listening to the, the podcast? Uh, or did you learn uh, about it because you had that guest on that first one and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. I want to go deep on this human trafficking yeah, it, it was more of the latter. Uh, you know, Jeremy Mayhew, uh, one of the co-founders of Deliver Fund, uh, a teammate of mine or a, a bud student uh, classmate of mine, um, you know, and so he was in the Dallas area and, and he had started Deliver Fund and, you know, kind of similar to like a lot of people I think, yeah, I know trafficking's a thing, mm-hmm. and, you know, it sucks and whatever. I had no idea the depths uh, or, or kind of the magnitude with which it was it was plaguing our society. And so when he came on and shared a lot of these statistics, for me, that was the slap in the face, especially having kids in that age range, 
to where I was just like, holy shit, like, why are we not doing more about this? Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, something as simple as, as the shutdowns for COVID, right. Is that again, like statistically, how many kids under the age of 18 die from, from coronavirus? It's, it's very, very small, but we've shut down schools and mandated vaccines and all this other shit. We haven't taken anywhere near that, that level of, uh, of mitigation protocols and, and applied them to sex trafficking. Why not? You know, like there is no good, good reason or excuse as to why, like, if you're willing to shut the country down and crush the economy for, you know, a few hundred kids that have died from COVID, who the fuck is not making the decision to, to do things that are at least that drastic for something, you know, that that's a thousand or 10,000 X the problem that coronavirus is for, for that age group, you know, and, and, uh, nobody has a good answer for that. Uh, you know, so there's just not enough emphasis on it. And, uh, and so, you know, I felt like, Hey, if I've got this platform and, and I know some people in these, uh, in these positions, like, uh, I, I felt a, an element of responsibility to, to bring it up and, and to continue to do so. You know? Yeah. I mean, why, why do you, so now that you've studied it, um, in depth, uh, why do you think like, I get shadow banned all the time. You can, the fake accounts pop up first. It doesn't count pop up until yeah. you put the exact whole thing in there, you know, jet car yeah. USA. Uh, and then finally, maybe yeah. it'll come up. It happens with gun companies all the time. You know, you talk, you got to type in six hour I N C and then finally it comes up. Um, yeah. like that happens all the time. They can, uh, they can go in and just don't, I did a, flashback or what is it called? Throwback Thursday. And it's just me, I think in Afghanistan holding my rifle. And uh, you can compare that to me standing in front of a tractor that I'm digging out of the snow one day apart. And you can look at the analytics and see how much they serve yeah. the one up versus the other. And it was like 10 times more with the tractor than they served up the other one. Yeah. You can, and it's them serving yeah. it to people that are actually following you. Yeah. So why do you think that these companies, uh, who have this, a uh, technological, uh, capability, uh, unmatched throughout human history um, and so much data on all of us collected and stored and algorithms that can sift through it so fast. Uh, why is human trafficking, why is it still a, I mean, human trafficking, maybe it's going to go on. Why is it still going on in the way that it is on these social platforms? Like what, what, what have you come, what conclusion have you come to uh, in thinking about that? Well, so, I mean, to me, the, the, the short answer is I don't know because I, I don't have access to that. The, the second part of that is that to me, like just using deductive reasoning, there's only one reason why it's still allowed, you know, and, and anybody can, can connect those dots and say, you know, if you're, if you're allowing it to happen, when you have the capability to stop it, like at a minimum, you're, you're condoning that behavior, you know, can, can I say that they're, they're a part of it, you know, no, I mean, I don't, I don't have any proof, but their, their lack of, of action says quite a bit, you know, um, you know, the, one of my favorite uh, adages is what you do speak so loud. I can't hear what you say. Mm. Like you, you can say you're anti everything, but your actions don't back that up, you know? So to me, like there, there should be way, uh, way harder questions being a asked from our government to, uh, to these social media platforms to, to get to the bottom of that. And if they're not doing it, I'd throw them in the same category. You know, the, the data is there, the statistics, you know, th those aren't up for debate. So, you know, it, it's a significant problem. It's, it's by far the biggest problem that 18 and under kids in this country face. And, and again, it, 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 it by itself, uh, you know, outshines all of the other things combined by a lot, yeah. you know, so if the government's not doing anything and big tech isn't doing anything to me, there's only one logical explanation as to why they're not doing anything. And, and it's because they're either part of it or they're at least okay with it. Uh, I, I don't know how, how else you answer that question without coming to that conclusion. Yeah. I mean, if they're not okay with me throwing a flashback Thursday or throwback Thursday, standing in front of a, you know, the street in Afghanistan, I mean, God, it's crazy. Uh, I'm going to have to, so that's why I get, it's very therapeutic for me to write these novels because I get to, uh, to dispatch I'll with bet. these guys yeah. in ways that uh, are very, very <laughs> painful and, and bloody. And, I, um, I'm surprised you haven't been shut down entirely. I know. Honestly, I know. I'm, the storylines. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm surprised Hollywood's willing to make a movie at that level too. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I know. I got, uh, it, it's interesting in that I didn't know going to Simon and Schuster, if they would see, like read the first novel, second novel, third novel, whatever, and then say, Hey, can you tone this back a bit? Or, Hey, can you take some of this? 
this stuff at. Never. I've had complete creative control of, the, of, of everything. They've never awesome. even hinted that I should do anything else. So I'm, I feel extremely, yeah. extremely fortunate. That's great. Um, and you've been so kind with your time, but I want to ask you a couple more things uh, about the book. You sure. use a word in here that I had not heard before. And if I had heard it, at least it hadn't registered with me. And it's pseudo activism. And uh, I don't even know if it's a real word or one you made up, but uh, yeah. it's a fantastic yeah. word. <laughs> hey, can you explain pseudo activism yeah. to, to everybody? Yeah, well, so I mean, it, to me, the kind of the <coughs> the common <coughs> common word is is social justice warrior. Really, you know, it, is that, and, and this I think stems from the victim of our own success mm -hmm. is that human beings are are designed to struggle to a certain extent. Like, there's a certain level of of stress, you know, from the uh, from the you know the way that your brain is wired, your lizard brain versus uh, you know the rest of your cognition, et cetera, is that you know, for, uh, for millennia, you know, our, our concerns were, you know, not, not being hunted or, uh, you know, finding food or, or, you know, predators, you know, think things that are big picture wise, something legitimately worth worrying about when there's an absence of those, then your brain basically searches for things to be pissed about and, and upset. And, and, you know, so now we're at a point where people are, are so bored, and, and so uh, not preoccupied with things that actually fucking matter is, is that they're, they're latching on to things to feel a sense of purpose. You know, the, that age old question of what's the meaning of life, what's purpose, you know, and, and that's why some of the most successful in terms of wealth people that I've met are also some of the most miserable people I've ever met because they don't have anything challenging them anymore. You know, it, is that they've been so successful for so long that they're, they're miserable wretches because, you know, not, nothing is, is doing it for them anymore. I mean, it's one of the, the reasons why you see, you know, A-list actors and, and musicians, you know, Chris Cornell hanging himself and, you know, pe people that, that are like, yeah, this, this sucks. I'm miserable. And it's like, dude, you have everything you could possibly want. And, and while it may seem counterintuitive at first, that's the reality of it. And so the pseudo activism comes in, in, in that vein where, um, you know, people are, are pissed about things that they're not really pissed about. It's that they're attaching themselves to something to feel like that they actually are making a difference. That's why you see, you know, suburban housewives carrying Black Lives Matter signs and, uh, you know, people that are that are firebombing, uh, you know, cattle ranches because they're, you know, vegan rights and, and all this other crap that, uh, you know, that, that in, in countries that you and I have been to and, and, and that are, you know, as we sit here speaking, where you know the the thought process of, of the general population there is just surviving. There aren't pronoun issues. There aren't vegans. There aren't uh, you know social justice warriors that are there that have all these causes that they're posting about and blogging about and, and picketing and, and uh, you know marching on Washington with signs about because they don't have have the time or the bandwidth to worry about superfluous shit like mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, and so that's where where the pseudo comes in is that it, it's it's fake. It's manufactured. Uh, you know, and, and it's it's a a miserable and pathetic attempt for people to to latch on to things to to make them feel like like they matter. You know, and, and it's sad. I think that goes hand in hand with uh, with a moral vanity that's, uh, that is very pervasive uh, out there. Yeah. Um, and when you're, you're you're doing things that you haven't researched, you haven't thought about, you put haven't uh, uh, spent the time considering, um, and uh, you're you're essentially doing that retweet. Um, and it's this, uh, this, this moral vanity that once again, connects you to those things that you say to take out, uh, of, of your decision-making process in here. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, that's why I think it's so important because you're touching on all these things that are so important in this country right now. And it's going to be this next 10 years, I think it's going to be very pivotal on, uh, on, well, on the future of the nation, obviously. But, uh, when we talk about the first amendment, when we talk about the second amendment, um, in which go hand in hand. Um, this next 10 years is going to be pivotal. And if you don't educate yeah. yourself ahead of time, and if you're, you're not studying these things, if you're not being thoughtful about them, uh, then there's really only one way, uh, that things are going to, going to go. And, uh, I try to remember, I try to remain hopeful, uh, as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Very difficult, especially at the end of the night when I sit down with my wife with a, oh, a glass of wine on the couch or whatever it is. And we're, uh, just talking about the day and everything that's going on. But, uh, how do you remain hopeful? You're studying all these things, obviously in depth on your own with your guests. You're talking about human trafficking, the border issues that you, uh, you go deep in on the podcast you talk about in the, the book too. I mean, you, you're, you're, 
through that podcast and through your own quest for, for knowledge and uh, continuing your, your education just as a, as a human and a citizen of this country, um, how do you remain hopeful for the future or, or do you? No, I, I do. Um, you know, to me, and, and that, that's actually the, the interesting and, and almost ironic other side of that coin of, of uh, you know, the, the feigned outrage and the pseudo activism is that when things actually really go to shit, you know, it's, it's also human nature to, to thrive, you know, and, and to not give up and to, and to, you know, get on the backside of that struggle. It's just that struggle needs to be real. And if you look, you know, historically, you know, just, just uh, yesterday was the, uh, you know, the, the Auschwitz liberation uh, um, anniversary, you know, and, and, and to me, like, it, it's hard to come up with, with a scenario that exists. that's a better example of, of people with that just Dude, I I refuse to give up, and and I I will not lose hope, and, and I will keep driving, and you're going to have to kill me to get rid of that. Is that you know that 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 exists either whether it should or shouldn't. You know, right now, unfortunately, we're in a in a time period where where it doesn't really need to exist, but it does because it's human nature. Well, you know, I think it ebbs and flows this way. Is that you know it, whether it's China invading or, or China and Russia invading, or there's a power grid outage, or you know some crazy legitimate pandemic that wipes off you know two thirds of the population. You know there, there's countless examples in history of things where where the human race was was legitimately held at, uh, dealt a shit sandwich of a hand, uh, and they persevered and they and they came together and, and they they overcame. We take nine twelve two thousand one as a good example. You know. 9, 10, 2001, the country was very different than it was two days later. Uh, you know, and, and unfortunately it takes events like that to do it. Um, you know, I wish that it didn't, but, uh, so that, that's how I remain hopeful is, is there are, are so many examples in history of, of the human spirit shining through, um, you know, and, and that isn't going to be lost until human beings don't exist. It's just, uh, you know, the, uh, kind of the, the reference with which we, attach that that mentality to may may shift significantly whether or not it's warranted man i love that um you know something else i think about i think about uh the end of the civil war and uh the con country coming back together so i think about that and then i think about what if we had social media in the 1860s um, where people that were not listening to a speech, were not reading a newspaper or a transcript of a speech that weren't actively involved in, uh, in staying up to date and then trying to bring the country back together. If you had those elements that wanted to continue to divide, then you can weaponize, as we see, social media today. What if you could weaponize social yeah. media back then? And no matter where you were in the world, uh, whether you're a U.S. citizen or not, uh, you had to have foreign influences, you got people within this country continuing to divide via this constant bombardment on these virtual platforms, yeah. would we still be the country we are today? And uh, yeah, I, I mean, know. it's, yeah, it, it's a scary, scary proposition to, to think what would have happened, you know, tech wise, if, if that, that type of stuff was available back then. And, and, you know, I, I would uh, venture to guess that, that no, I, I think it probably would have panned out different, uh, you know, and, that, and that's the scary part about what's, what's going on now. But again, I think, you know, mother nature is, is, is queen, you know, and, and uh, you know, technology, um, you know, is, is that double-edged sword where one, one side is sharper than the other, um, you know, and, and, ultimately, like, I think, you know, planet earth and mother nature has the ability to, to make corrections and, and she will, you know, uh, one, one way or another. And, uh, you know, so to me, it, it's, it's, uh, while it's an alarming proposition to think of, of what would, would have happened back then and, and what type of influences these are having, I, I still do think in that, you know, kind of roller coaster or, or ebb and flow, um, you know, big problem versus little problem versus, you know, resets and corrections, you know, no different than the stock market or, or what have you is that, uh, you know, I think human, human nature goes through that. And, uh, and you may see a, a massive correction here, maybe even in our lifetime. I hope not, but, uh, but you might. Yeah. Be prepared. <clears throat> oh man, yeah. dude. Well, Thank you so much for spending this time. I, you, I mean, you have so much going on that, uh, that I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I sincerely appreciate you sitting down and, and doing this. Um, but, uh, trying to keep up with you, oh, Jack. man, you know, I'll tell you what, it, when I see everything you have going on everything you've built, uh, and how you just continue 
to build all these different things. It's incredible to me. It's so inspiring. And, uh, you know, you, you do have so many things it. going on. Like people can probably just type in Mike Ritland and it all pops up, yeah. but yeah, Trico's, you got the yeah, Warrior Dog really. Foundation, you have the, uh, the pet side of the house. Like, uh, you have all the social media channels, you have Mike Drock podcasts, you have the books. I mean, you have all of, is there one yeah. central hub for all these things or are they just all out there and then connect to one another? How does, how does that work? Yeah. So just go to, to Mike Ritland co, uh, dot com, uh, And that's kind of the, the hub where everything, whether it's speaking books, warrior dog, dogs, uh, food, treats, supplements, online training, you name it. It's, it's all kind of right there. So, uh, or just Googling my name, it'll, it'll pop up right away too. But, uh, same with, you know, all the social media handles and, and everything like that. I do have one question for you. I don't know if you can answer it or not. Uh, do you have a, a cameo and, uh, in the series, I'm going to have to tell you which, offline, you which is the, which probably tells you the uh, answer. So uh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, That's uh, awesome. it's pretty cool. cool. It's pretty cool. I, I, uh, yeah, I feel awesome. very, very fortunate that it came out the way it's did, way it did. And, uh, what was interesting though, also, cause it kind of feeds into what we're talking about here with, uh, influencers and you talk about celebrities in here to include politicians and, and that sort of a thing. Uh, when people see somebody, a Hollywood actor that they know, walk up on stage, accept an award, uh, you know, say something that is probably not in line with your beliefs as a, as an American citizen, but you still kind of like the movies and yeah, but there are 350 other people that helped make that film. And they were all so good at their individual jobs, no matter what it was, um, to make it possible for that thing to get made. And for that one person to be up on stage spouting off about whatever they're spouting off about. Um, yeah. so when we think about, I'm never watching a movie from that guy again, or that, that girl again, or whatever it is, uh, it was so interesting to be yeah. on set and I'd bring a box of books. I'd sit it there in video village where all the executive producers are. And like the teamsters would walk up and be like, Hey, can you sign the book for me? My, my son's going to boot camp tomorrow. And, uh, Hey, what's your favorite rifle? Oh, you know, I'm going, uh, I'm going hog hunting next week in Texas. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and other executive producers are like, you know, this just doesn't really happen all the time, but this constant flow yeah. of people, the hair and makeup person coming through saying, my cousin's going on his first deployment as a Marine. Uh, he loves your books and uh, signing away and talking That's to so her cool. and they wish him luck and, and all that sort of thing. So yeah. all those people coming up to talk about motorcycles, about land cruisers, about hunting, about knives, um, you know, that that's those 350 other people that are making that thing happen. So, yeah. uh, that, that kind of yeah. gave me, uh, gave me hope as well. Agreed. It, to, to me, it also further highlights uh, how selfish it is for actors to to fuck it up that way. Like, just leave your your beliefs at the door. And, and I wish that they realized, you know, that when they do that, it's affecting the people that you know that are making a more normal wage and not you know making eight figures to to make a movie. And, and maybe you should just keep your mouth shut and, and let everybody uh, you know let everybody win. But uh, that, that'll probably never happen. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I can't wait to, uh, to, uh, for that, uh, for the terminal list to get out there for you to watch it. Let me know what you think of the dog oh, part yeah. of it and, and all that, but, yeah, uh, wait. man, thank you so much. I'm so, it's such an honor to know you, such an honor yeah. to have gone through training with you. Um, thank you for all you've done for this <clears throat> nation and what you continue to do and inspire, not just veterans, but everybody that, uh, that, that has a dream and, uh, and look at what looks at what you're doing and says, oh man, that's awesome. You can do it. It's freaking awesome. I, no, I, I mean, I can't, can't thank you enough for the kind words and, uh, and, and right back at you. I mean, you're, you're an inspiration for all of us. And, uh, I love to see all the good fortune coming your, your way. It's, you know, and I know it's not uh, just good fortune. You've worked your ass off and, and, uh, come a long way. And it's, uh, it's awesome to see you doing all the things you're doing. So I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having me on. It's an honor to be on here. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Hopefully we can meet up in, uh, in person soon, but, uh, yeah. And until yeah. then, take care, everybody else, get the book, gift the book, more importantly, to uh, to others in your life yeah. that you care about. Um, and uh, Give it to somebody that you think it, it will offend them. <laughs> that's especially. a good one, too. <laughs> that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. man. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks again. Take care. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll link up soon. Navy Federal Credit Union. The name would suggest that it is just for members of the Navy, but that's not true. It is open to all members of the military, regardless of branch, veterans and 
their families. So go to NavyFederal.org, check them out. Federally insured by NCUA. They have uh, certainly financed a few of my motorcycles over the years. I've been a member since 1996. So uh, car loans, home loans, motorcycle loans, whatever it might be, be sure to check them out. And if you're just getting started and need some help investing, they can help you there too. So be sure and check out NavyFederal.org. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. I know I'm not the only one looking for healthy snacks for me and my family, especially after a very busy 2021 as we move into 2022. And if you've been following me, you know I'm looking forward to figuring out a schedule where I'm getting a little more sleep, where I'm getting some exercise, and where I am eating right. And that is where Paleo Valley comes in. Check them out, paleovalley.com. And you can use Danger Close 15 at checkout for 15% off your order. Now, this stuff is awesome. Paleo Valley, uh, how do I know it's awesome? because I just crushed a few of these beef sticks and these things are awesome. There's all sorts of different flavors, jalapeno, original, teriyaki, summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, and they are awesome. So Paleo Valley, thank you so much for sending these out to me. Uh, And for those that are wondering, these beef sticks are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished. Many on the market claim to be grass-fed, but actually are finished on grains. And they use beef sourced from small domestic farms in the U.S. This is a family-owned company, very small family-owned company. So they're making sure they do it right, that they are not cutting corners. They're prioritizing health over profit and uh, just an awesome group of people. What else do they send me here? I have these superfood bars here with grass-fed bone broth proteins. And there's all sorts of flavors here too. Pumpkin spice. How did you guys know? Awesome. Dark chocolate chip. (laughs) I'm going to crush those. Lemon meringue and apple cinnamon. Uh, All sorts of supplements out there. So be sure to go check out paleovalley.com. Enter code DANGERCLOSE15 for that 15% off your order. Once again, it's 100% grass-fed beef with higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins and minerals, and bioavailable protein. So thank you so much. I am fired up to get move into 2022 here. And uh, this will be a part of my journey. And look at this one right here. Uh, Organic super greens. Oh yeah. I am all over that. So check them out. Paleovalley.com. Danger close 15 at checkout for 15% off that order. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the danger close podcast. I have a few things to go over today. I'm going to start with this Aries watch. So if you don't know what Aries Watch Company is or Matt Graham, owner-operator, uh, go check them out. Love what Matt has going on over there at Aries. And this was a gift from Evan Hafer of Black Rifle Coffee Company. So Evan, thank you so much for thinking of me. You know how much I love my watches in particular, my Aries. So yeah, this is a diver one and uh, love this watch. Too cool. Too cool. What else? How about this? New Bedford ship supply. Got to hang out with the owner operator over the summer and it's located out in Massachusetts. So if you need something uh, nautical maritime in nature, go check out new Bedford ship supply. Cool crew over there. And what's this shirt? Can you see that? How about now? So Inglorious Amateurs, check out Inglorious Amateurs. You can follow them on the social channels. You can uh, go to their website, ingloriousamateurs.com. But what is this? So looks like National Park Service symbol. Hmm. But if you look closer, what's that up there? And who's this guy down here? What's he holding right there? What is this OSS business, Office of Strategic Services? And uh, what's Area B? Hmm. Anyway, check it out. Amazing history. And uh, yeah, very cool. So definitely check out Inglorious Amateurs. All right. Look at this. Wolf Brigade. 
Greg Walsh. So Wolf Brigade made that mace that you may have seen me talk about that I got for Christmas that was made by Wolf Brigade, but um, uh, I got it from Sorenex, from Bert Soren over there. And it is awesome. They put the cross tomahawks on there for me. Uh, all I need to do now is start working out with it. Um, it's, uh, it's high time. This mace is going to be a big part of that. It's just too cool. So Wolf Brigade, um, wolfbrigade.com. Very cool. Sorenex, of course. Uh, you guys know Bert Soren and everything they have going over on there at, uh, at Sorenex. Just too cool. And uh, Greg Walsh of uh, Wolf Brigade sent me these two books. So thank you so much. Um, the gift of a book means so much to me. This is called The Theft of Age. And uh, already from reading the back, uh, knowing a little bit more about uh, about Greg, um, really looking forward to this. And this is the other one, War of Attrition, right here. Bam, nonfiction stories, societal oddities, and counterculture observations. Um, so very cool. Greg, thank you so much for sending these and signing them. Uh, means means a ton to me. So. Very cool. What else? All right, check this out. Had my eye on this ice axe for a while. Look at this. And you can adjust it. So got this Barney's Sports Chalet up in Alaska. Saw them out at Safari Club International. And I've been wanting one of these for a while. So I got one. But uh, this thing's cool. And what does this mean? Does it mean I'm going to get out on a sheep hunt this year? I don't know. Maybe not this year. There's a uh, a lot of work to do still, but uh, maybe the next year or the year after. But um, yeah, this thing is just super cool. So I want one of those for a while. And then I want to train with that and train with this and just see what. So this one, obviously not adjustable. Still got the tags on them right there. But um, yeah, very cool. Barney Sports Chalet. You can check them out on Instagram. Also Frontier Gear of Alaska. And they do uh, they have some great stuff up there. If you're in Anchorage and you're a hunter, or even if you're not a hunter, you just want to go in and check out what they have going on. Um, check them out up in Anchorage. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Mike Ritland, just type in Mike Ritland in your search bar and a bunch of stuff will pop up. His website pops up. You can find out more about his online dog training. You can find out more about the Warrior Dog Foundation, Tricos, Dog Treats, his other books. Uh, it's all there. Social channels, connect with him uh, on all of those different platforms. Check out the Mike Drop podcast and everything else that he has going on. So Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to do that. It's always great to catch up. And you can find me at officialjackcar.com. You can go to Jack Car USA for the merch and it is at Jack Car USA on the social channels. In the Blood is available for pre-order now. Comes out on May 31st, 2022. But get those pre-orders in now. And if you enjoyed the conversation, please leave a five-star rating and review to help spread the word. Sincerely appreciated. Until the next time, take care, be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.